Peoria City Council meeting will now come to order. <coughs> Please rise for a moment of quiet reflection and the Pledge of Allegiance led by Council Member Patena. Clerk will please call the roll. Mayor Carlett? Here. Vice Mayor Edwards? Here. Councilmember Patena? Here. Councilmember Vinsbacher? Here. Councilmember Finn? Here. Councilmember Hunt? Here. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council special meeting of March 30th, 2017. Uh, we have one item on our study, study session agenda this evening and that is the fiscal year 2018 budget presentation. And we'll turn it over to uh, Carl Swinson. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, welcome back. Um, day two of our two day, uh, two evenings that we've set aside to, to go through the budget. And um, as um, you'll all remember, of course, from yesterday, we made great progress. We got through um, all of the operating uh, budget, uh, went through the departments. Um, and we have some follow ups that we'll get to um, at the end of the evening tonight. We take close notes on the conversation, and so there's always things that we want to report back to you on or let you know how we're responding to some of the things that you brought up. So we'll do that uh, at the end of the evening tonight. Um, so what we have uh, in this session uh, that we, we have this evening are um, a couple of important areas uh, that are remaining that are sort of outside of the departmental operating budget presentations. Um, and the first is the utility rate uh, discussion, always a real important discussion, of course, to, to get into. Um, the next is the capital improvement program, which is that program that builds all of the necessary uh, facilities uh, for our growing city and maintains those facilities that we have. And then we have a few minutes for wrap up. Um, and of course, just like last night, uh, we encourage conversation uh, throughout. Uh, we have presentations, of course, but uh, are always happy to, to stop and, and uh, take questions, comments from from uh, the elected officials. So uh, with that, we'll kind of move in, if, if, unless there's anything that uh, you want to uh, talk about before we get started. I think we're ready to go. Ready to go? Okay. Very good. Well, I'm going to uh, do a couple of slides here as we get into the, the rate uh, utility rate discussion sort of contextually. Uh, and then Katie uh, will walk through, um, uh, along with Hal, uh, more of the, of the details and go through the, the, the presentation. But um, it's always interesting at this point to look at where um, the city stands with respect to uh, our neighbors, those, the, the, the other cities in the metropolitan area. And what you'll see on this chart is um, all of the, the cities uh, throughout the Phoenix metropolitan area uh, and you see the, the darker uh, shaded items there are our current rates uh, on the right, um, the proposed 2018 rates in the middle, and the 2019 rates uh, just to the left of that. Um, and as you know, we're doing uh, two-year cycles on our rates. So every two years we do um, a, an analysis of our rates, um, and, and Katie will get into that in a minute. Um, but it's a two-year uh, program that we're recommending. So it would be um, increases, uh, small increases, but um, nonetheless uh, increases in 18 and 19. And what this chart shows, and, and the next one, go ahead and, and <laughs> since you got the other one up there, um, what, the, what this shows, and, the, and all of you are, are well familiar with, is how well we have done at holding down our rates. So uh, what, what you saw in the last slide was for the, the metropolitan area. What this slide shows is uh, our rates in the same three ways, current, uh, proposed 18, and proposed 19, against our neighbors here in the West Valley. Uh, so what you, what you see here is we, even at the, at the higher end of the um, period, that is uh, 2019, we're still the lowest in the West Valley. Um, and what you saw in the previous slide, if you can go back one more again, is that we're um, very close. We're third from the lowest in uh, the region. 
uh, even with um, the, the increases in 19. And that's a tribute, I think, to the leadership of the council and the hard work of the staff over the years to, to make sure that we keep our rates as low as possible. Um, and as part of that philosophy that we talked about yesterday and, and the other night, um, in making sure that we are providing um, excellent value to uh, our taxpayers, and in this case, uh, our rate payers, uh, because we know that um, making sure that our, we keep our taxes and our rates as low as possible uh, is something that's important to you. Um, but we do need uh, some rate increases uh, here uh, because of some increases that we're seeing in the cost of water um, and some of the other elements that are outside of our control uh, that um, have to be reflected in, in the utility rates. Another thing that I'll mention uh, before Katie starts is um, and the council's been really good about, about the, the principles of sound financial management and holding to those principles. And one of the important principles that we follow with respect to our utilities is that we, we don't ever use money outside of those enterprise utilities for, for any other purpose. So, so the money that's collected in our water and wastewater and solid waste funds stay in those funds. We don't use that money for the general fund um, and, and some cities will do that. Some cities will spend their utility funds for other things. And one of those real important principles that we follow religiously is making sure that we have what we call fund integrity, that we keep those, those funds uh, where they belong, uh, in, in our opinion, that is in the fund that they're, that they're, that they're charged for. So our, when we look at our rates, we're only looking for the rates necessary to fund that activity. So whether it's water, wastewater, or solid, solid waste, it's only uh, to fund the activities um, of that specific uh, fund. So, um, so that's an important um, point I wanted to make uh, before turning it over to Katie. Can I ask a question sure. uh, before we move forward? Um, these, these graphs and charts are, are really telling, and I, I appreciate this illustration. It makes such a big difference. But I want to know on the, the comparison, the one that shows Peoria Current 18 and 19, do those 18 and 19 include the water that we talked about last night? In other words, um, more recharge water, making sure that we have the water that CAP might need as they deal with Lake Mead and higher reserves and things like that. All of that is covered in these graphs? Yes, uh, Mayor, we, we, as I mentioned, I think last night, it was that we look at rates more on a, on a planning period. It extends beyond just the two year that we're talking about rates tonight. We do expect that this will cover the next two years what we've been asking for in the budget, but we are going to continue to see additional requests needed. And I'll get into that a little bit in the presentation on the cap rates to kind of explain why that's happening and, and what we expect to see based on their most recent information they've provided. Okay. Thank you. So just to, the short of it is we take very much to heart keeping the rates as, as low as possible, uh, but also making sure that we, we have the funds available to fund these very important utilities that we have. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kate. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mayor and Council, I'd like this evening to just spend a little bit of time talking with you about um, a couple of our utility areas, including water and wastewater, and then we'll also spend just a couple of minutes talking about solid waste. And I'm going to talk a little bit about rate planning objectives, and that really goes to, uh, speaks to both water, wastewater, and solid waste. So although it's under the water and wastewater uh, agenda item, the same principles are used when we look at um, our solid waste fund. And then some factors that influence the rate recommendations that we're putting forward, and then reminding you that the way we've done rates more recently has been to look at two-year rate recommendations um, so that we're not coming back each and every year and going through this, but that we're having an opportunity to present to you, and, and that's better planning on our part too, um, but also allows us to know kind of what we can expect going forward and then how that's going to affect future years, things like that. So um, just wanted to give you that agenda. So we'll start with water and wastewater, and, and this really is the rate planning object objectives. And although it says water and wastewater, again, it, it includes solid waste. And that is that when we develop a rate structure, it, we want to keep these objectives in mind, and we focus on ongoing revenue streams that recover those operational and capital costs associated with those various um, service lines. So, um, and we want to look at those rates again, like I said, in a long-term perspective. So, if the City of Peoria does not look at rates just, again, just like our forecast, right? 
We look at five years. Our planning period is five years. We need to kind of have an understanding of what's happening over those next five years and try to adjust our rates so that we can smooth that over that five-year period so we're not having major spikes in any given year. So that's really kind of one of our um, objectives. Um, when we updated our forecast or our planning forecast for water and wastewater and we looked at our base charges and our volumetric charges, if you recall, you have two kind of components there, the base charge and the volumetric, volumetric charge. The base charge is more of your fixed costs. The volumetric is going to be based upon the amount of use, water use that um, uh, residents and, and businesses have. So. We also look at what, so we want to understand the cost of service associated with that. We focus on customer equity, right? So the, among the various planning groups, or excuse me, the, the various groups, um, you know, can we maintain equity um, between those groups? Conservation is a key element of our water and wastewater program. So we want to understand, we certainly encourage conservation. Again, we have to recognize that with conservation, that's less consumption. Not a bad thing, but you know we need to understand how consumption um, is going to play into our rate structure as well. And then, of course, really focusing on affordability for our customers. And you saw that in what uh, Carl just presented in those uh, comparatives with other cities, is that um, you know we want to be affordable, and we believe that we are with the rate structures and the rates that we have in place. I think this is an interesting slide, and it just gives you some conceptual idea, and I'm going to hit this every time, I think, but it gives you some conceptual idea of kind of where or who is using the water um, in the city. So clearly residential and multifamily take more than two-thirds of our um, water consumption in the city. Commercial is roughly around 8%, but, the, but what I want to draw some attention to is our landscape category. This is probably our fastest growing category. So these are those who are using um, water to do their landscaping. This could be HOAs, this could be golf courses in some cases, um, but who are really in that tier of landscape using the amount of, of water that puts them in that landscape tier. Excuse me, and so sure. you're saying that's the fastest growing? It seems like we should have had some reduction in that with, um, are you getting get into that? No, go ahead, oh, ask okay. your question. Um, Westbrook Village coming offline mm -hmm. from City of Peoria water, did that affect that at all? With their golf courses? Yeah, that does that does uh, does affect it a little bit, but we also are seeing more landscape usage. So as development comes online, there's more landscaping to water. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, there's there's definitely that's a category. I'm just giving you some context there. That's a category we're seeing go up faster than the other categories, I should yeah. say. But it's also you know not a huge category, so it's easier to go up. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Oops, excuse me. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the factors that are um, imp um, impacting our rates. Um, we continue to manage with as much efficiency as we can. Um, and you may recall that a number of years ago we made a lot of efficiency um, improvements to our plants um, and tried to really reduce our overall um, use of water and electricity. Um, or uh, sorry, line up our electricity and water costs, those costs per uh, thousand gallons produced. Um, worked with our utility, our APS and, and SRP utilities to really bring down some of those costs. Um, and th but there are some normal operation and maintenance costs that um, go up from year to year um, that we did incorporate into the rate planning. These increases are largely driven um, and include general increases for things such as staffing costs, materials and supplies, electricity, chemicals, those types of things. A second significant factor um, in, in the rate uh, review was the need um, for rate adjustments is the amount, of the amount of funding that's necessary to do the city's capital project program. And over the course of the program, there are a number of important projects that need to be completed, and we are best able to predict those that are needed in the near term better than in the f farther out. And of course, we want to understand that most capital programs are a little bit front-loaded because we know better what we need in the next three to five years than we do necessarily in ten. Um, and these include some important projects such as we have some um, important maintenance and repair projects, well rehabs and quality improvements, and then of course um, early in our program in the next three, over the next three years we're doing Pyramid Peak water treatment um, plant and the operations and maintenance associated with that. So this just gives you a visual of kind of how that's broken out in our capital program. We have about half of our capital program is dedicated to expansion. So that gives you a good indication there. Now remember, when we talk about expansion, we 
also want to bring in mind the impact fees, right? The impact fees are one thing that we collect to be able to offset some of the cost of that expansion. Um, and that's all driven by growth. Fortunately, water and wastewater wasn't significantly impacted by the impact fee changes, but that is a source. The trouble with impact fee is that you kind of have to have the money before you, you know, before the homes get there. So you're always kind of in the rears, in the rears, trying to get the um, the impact fees collected after you've made a, a significant investment. Um, you can also see on here that maintenance and replacement. So maintenance, repair, and replacement um, that makes up about 33% of our 10-year capital program. So really, those are the major um, new uh, project or major cost components of our capital program over the next 10 years. And this slide just gives you a sense of kind of what I talked about, that little bit of front-loading of the capital program. But if you look at where some of those costs are, you can see that we have four plant expansions scheduled within our 10-year um, capital program. So that's pretty significant. Um, first one being Pyramid Peak, the second one at Joe Max. Um, we also have Beardsley scheduled. And depending, Greenway kind of always is at the tail end of our plan. We just have to wait and see what kind of development occurs in kind of the infill areas of the city. And as that um, continues to grow or we grow up, possibly, we may have to make some expansions. But we keep that in there because we know that um, at some point we do need to do some expansions there. And then there's also some planned adjustments and components of the rate that the city pays to the CAP. And we talked a little bit about that yesterday. Um, and that's creating pressure on the water operating costs over the forecast period. And since this source of supply is vital to our city's overall water portfolio, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about that. Um, here we have many cities in the valley, just as Peoria, um, rely on the water that's delivered by CAP, um, the Central Arizona Project, to support our water demands and growth and to replenish our, our groundwater, our, replenish and store groundwater that will add to our long-term storage um, requirements. And currently it supplies about 40% of our overall demand for water. So that's a pretty significant piece when you think about all the sources of water that we have. CAP is about 40% of that. Um, Peoria pays cap under two primary rates. The fixed component that you can see on here in red, and the white bar there kind of just shows you that's 2018. That's kind of where we are. So we're kind of giving you a look back and a look forward as to what's happened with those rates. Um, and the fixed component, which is in the red here, comprises the capital charges. And we're charged these based on our allocation of water. So whatever, we, whatever we've been allocated through their um, allocation, okay? Um, and that rate is increasing almost 50% um, over this year and next. And we anticipate that to kind of stabilize. As you can kind of see there, it's going to then kind of stabilize going out. The second component um, here in the blue is the variable component. And this, this is based upon our water... Um, our deliveries, you know, what we actually receive, what our deliveries are. And based on the rates that have recently been provided by CAP, um, you can see that over the next five, year of our, five years of our planning period, we're expecting those costs to continue to grow. So when we talk about what's in the budget, that covers us the first couple of years, um, and then we would expect to continue to see some rate increases in, in the years going beyond. Um, and these are also growing, and this, this kind of speaks to the anticipation of a drought condition. Um, so that's what CAP is, is um, basing some of these, this growth um, on, on that as well. So these, um, you can kind of see on the left there, currently where the, where the white line is, about 20% of our o &M costs go to the cap delivery costs or the cap rate costs. And we expect that between now and 2022, we'll be up to about 24% of our o &M costs. So it's the fastest growing component of our overall costs related to our um, water and wastewater system. So I did want to just take a minute and just talk. This one just shows you water. So this gives you a water rate history um, and shows kind of what we've um, seen over the last uh, number of years. The combined, we are re recommending that a combined water and wastewater rate of 2.5% for this year and next, um, which would be roughly, a, on average, about $1.50 per year um, increase. And this chart shows that just for water, um, the amount of an, on a typical residential bill would be about, so about $1.02 of that in the first year and about $1.17 of that $1.50 in the second year is what this is representing. On the wastewater side, same sort of story, and in the first year it would be about $0.46, cents, and in the second year, $0.34. Cents. So this is kind of what it breaks down to. So we're looking at um, our current 
combined water and wastewater um, residential bill on an average residential bill is about $65.76. With a 2.25% increase, it would go to $67.24. And then another 2.25 would take it to $68.75. So you can see the dollar amount change. It's roughly about $1.50 a year. Any questions on water? Council, do you have any questions on any of those rates? Okay, I'll move forward with solid waste. So similarly, similar to water, solid waste has the same inflationary, um, you know, costs associated with it, just in different categories. So you um, have been approving through the budget process and other processes some additional um, solid waste operators and trucks totally and 100% driven by the kind of growth that we've seen and the areas that we need to serve in the community. And with that growth, obviously, um, we need to address those costs and those um, costs of the people, cost of the supplies, cost of landfill, um, gas, all of those things um, have been are part of this. Um, we do expect some increases in our landfill rates, and we also expect to receive lower revenues on recycling. That's the market that's going on right now. Um, we've had our staffing remain relatively stable for five years, uh, 2010 to 2015, uh, but with the, accelerated, with the growth accelerating, our staffing ratios became real tight. So we've added, last year we added a position, this year we're adding in a truck, this year we're adding another three positions and two trucks. Um, and those increases coupled with the rising cost of landfill and the um, lowering of the cost of recycling um, revenues or lowering recycling revenues is, is creating a situation where we need to um, request a rate adjustment. Having said that, we have not had a rate adjustment in the solid waste rate fund or solid waste fund for five years. And the last adjustment we had was in 2012, and that was a 13% rate decrease. So what that looks like on the chart, if you like to look at charts, is that you can see that we went from 1506 through 2009 through 2012 down to $13.10. And we've been holding that steady for the last five years as we've been growing. And now we're at a point where those, those ratios just aren't, aren't working as well, and we need to request about a um, 50%, 50 cent, excuse me, <laughs> not percent, 50 cent rate adjustment. So what I think is important is that, back to what Carl was mentioning before, is that when we look at what that means when we compare ourselves to other cities and the relative cost to live in Peoria, we have a very um, low cost to live in Peoria related to utility rates. Um, so this is what we would be pro projecting the rates would be on an average residential utility bill. Um, and as you can see, we don't change our relative position comparative to other cities in the valley. Um, and, but we, and I would also tell you that these other cities that are in here are probably going to be adjusting their rates sometime over the next two years as well. So where they end up, we don't know yet, but we'll keep an eye on that. So can I sure. ask a few questions here? Sure. Uh, it looks like, you know, we are use, we're still using multiple landfills, right? Going mm -hmm. to Glendale and Phoenix yep. and, and um, recycling yep. places in, in multiple places points yes um, okay so uh, it looks like all the places where we go have higher uh, solid waste rates than we have yeah. at least that segment on their bar graph is bigger is right. that true is that because they're I think there a number of these do have landfills or um, recycling centers but one of the things I would say is that you know one of the benefits of us not having that is that there's a significant cost to operating and managing and maintaining mm -hmm. landfills um, you know so um, I know Stuart if you want to and closing landfills and things like that. Right. Mayor, I think it's an excellent question. Part of what the, what the chart doesn't represent is the differing levels of service. Mm -hmm. While every community provides weekly refuse and recycling, loose trash is a big variable across the valley. Mm -hmm. There are some communities that do it monthly. Some do it quarterly. Um, we do it twice a year. Um, in addition, as you sort of alluded to, Phoenix, as an example, has a number of older landfills. They have, have had to do remediation, had a lot of gas issues. So they're dealing with that. That ultimately gets absorbed as a part of the residential rate structure. Um, so it's, it's a little bit different everywhere. I can tell you, certainly relative to our landfill rates that we're paying, particularly with Glendale, they are extremely competitive. And, and Katie's cautionary note about where I think rates are going to go in the next several years there, as they move into their north area and do some other things, I think we're going to start seeing some increases. But we've benefited for the past three or four years in terms of a very uh, reasonable rate for disposal yeah. services. 
Okay, and so can you address recycling? Is there something that we sure. can do to, to get more revenue from that? Mm -hmm. Mayor, I, that's gonna be a real challenge. The, the globally, the markets for a lot of commodities, including and primarily papers, the biggest one, mm -hmm. have dropped significantly. I can tell you um, directly, and particularly in my, my time in that other West Valley city, um, <laughs> we would see revenue on an aggregate value of all the recyclables at 180, maybe as much as $200 a ton. Right now, that number is probably 120, 100. So as a result, what, whether it's Glendale that we're taking to or taking material to waste management or the city of Phoenix, they've all had to cut back their arrangements. And so mm -hmm. the days of having very um, uh, reasonable floor prices for materials, the agencies aren't gonna provide that. They're gonna really have to go off a market study. And, and as a result, the floor price we might have seen before that was 25 or $30 a ton, we might be getting 15 or 10 as a base price. And you're just talking about paper. I'm, well, all, but yeah, but that total aggregate value, yes, yeah. Okay. So but paper is 60% of the recyclable material that we, that we typically collect in this process. So it's the big driver relative to everything else. Are we still finding that glass is, is best for us to continue to take? Mayor, yes, and again, because the way our arrangement is with all the other communities is we, we, our truck comes in the facility, it's weighed. So they aren't sorting out what we brought in. They're saying if we brought in 10 tons, we're getting X amount for that. Mm -hmm. Glass has a lot of weight. Yeah. So relative, it, it's not a valuable commodity. It's probably worth 5 or $10 a ton, so it's pretty low. Um, but from a weight standpoint, that helps us in terms of bringing recyclables in and allowing us to ultimately have a, a stronger diversion rate. Good. Okay. And then my last question is, what about green waste? I mean, I know that's a really complicated subject, but can it help? Um, it, well, and it, it can and it can't. The, I guess really the answer is right now, the jury's still out on that. Um, Phoenix and Mesa both have programs. Um, both their programs ask the residents to pay $5 a month more for that additional can. So when you, when you look at a residential rate that's 1360 and then asking a resident to pay 40% more mm -hmm. for a, a green can, that's a, that's a challenge. Um, and it's similar. Phoenix is getting ready to build a much larger at their 27th Avenue and um, baseline facility, a green waste facility yeah. where they plan to take their material to. But for all the homes that they offer to within a area of their city, less than 5% participate in it. So it's, it's a function of do people want to pay, do they have enough green waste, and because green waste isn't just everything that's green. Oleander, palm are both significant challenges in terms of mixing in with a compost. Um, so when they talk about green, you start withering down mm -hmm. to sort of tree and bark material, grass, those sorts of things. It's um, as agencies that want to process that material like a Scott's fertilizer or somebody, they want a very particular um, uh, profile of material. And so I think Phoenix and the others have been trying to look at, well, what if we mix it all or try to pull some things out? Can we, where's that sweet spot? Yeah. And I, at this point, I think it's still sort of immature in its process to make a real good determination about what the best solution is. Mm. Okay, so it looks like we're kind of where we're going to be for a while, huh? But we will continue to certainly evaluate, and, and we did, as, as the mayor and the council may recall, we did participate with a number of other Valley cities in the study from ASU that really looked at holistically organic waste and green waste. They also looked at food waste, you know, and other things that could be put into a separate container. But that first challenge is how is it collected? Because if we're going to put another can in people's homes and collect it separately, now we need another truck to come by or some other resource to come get it. That creates a cost, it creates um, a challenge for folks now having potentially three bins in their home instead of two. Um, so we need to figure out some of those logistics in addition to the market component. So is that regional study complete? It has been completed, yes. And it, and it essentially said communities that want to do this can, it's not a it's not going to necessarily save you money, it's not, but it will definitely cost more. And, mm -hmm. and they looked at, they really sort of encourage people to look at um, green barrel only collection. Great if, that, if you have that system, but that creates a, a different cost than say just trying to divert green waste from our existing loose trash yeah. collection program and take it separately. It's a lot of stuff. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I probably made it longer right there. So No, that's all right. I would love to see that study, though, if you've got We can chance. absolutely prepare that. Okay, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
So to wrap it up a little bit um, on the uh, utility rates, what we would be looking at when we add in the solid waste rate um, is about a 2.5% uh, rate adjustment for fiscal year 18 on the total utility bill. It's about $1.98, just under $2. And again, we're not proposing anything for 2019 at this time. Um, we will come back if we have a significant need in that area, but um, that would make the second year about a 1.9% overall bill adjustment or, or an additional $1.51. So we did adopt um, the notice of intent on March 31st. That's a statutory requirement for us to inform um, residents that we are um, considering uh, rate, rate adjustments. And then we have our public hearing scheduled for uh, May 16th, and that would be when council would ultimately be adopting the rate, and that is the, um, the meeting following the adoption of our tentative budget. And that's it for me. Council Any questions? Questions? Comments? Yes, Council Member Binsbach. Thank you, Mayor. So the fees, when you evaluate the fees, this is the focus is cost recovery. So right. with the utility rates, the focus is on cost recovery, not trying to get any additional amount, just enough to cover the cost of the operation. So all of it goes into an enterprise fund. Yes, it does. And it's all used to pay for the service, That's to provide right. the service. Yep. So if we didn't do this and we had a shortfall, where would that come from? If we didn't do this and we had a shortfall, we do have reserve requirements for these, so it would dip into our reserves, our available reserves mm -hmm. for these um, for these funds, all of our major operating funds like this, we do have in our principles of sound financial management reserve requirements. So, you know, and we have at times, you know, been close to, you know, needing to have rate right. adjustments just to get our reserve requirements could still happen, back in it line. It could like. still, it would yeah. still happen. We would still be able to go forward, but we would be in a, we'd have to come back with a much more significant rate adjustment. Okay, thank you. Right, or reprioritize our projects and our operations. Okay, I think we're good, thank you. We'll move to the capital. All right, yes, let's move to the next section. You hit, we'll put up hit the, the next button. one. The, um, as Andy's, we're passing the clicker off to Andy Granger <laughs> a little bit on the, um, the capital program. Of course, this is uh, that program, as I mentioned at the outset, that. Um, funds all of the important um, facilities of the growing city. And, and um, so that is roadways, utility uh, capital program, as Katie just talked about, um, the storm drainage program, um, the public safety, the buildings, um, the facilities uh, like the, the campus that we're, we're sitting in right now. Um, all of that, all of those facilities um, are within our capital improvement program. And so we project out um, those uh, those costs, the parks, the the um, uh, public spaces that we need in, in the growing city, and that's in a balanced 10-year plan. Um, and that's a real hallmark again of the of the financial management of the city that we have a 10-year uh, balanced CIP, and that's important uh, because we're able then to make make sure that we have the funds to build the facilities and the funds to operate those facilities once they're built. Um, because every, you know, if you think about bringing a park on or um, a fire station on, obviously there's, a, there's the cost of building the facility, but there's the cost, of course, of operating the facility. And we always make sure that that operating tail, as we refer to it, um, is funded within our operating budget as well. So there's a real nexus between the capital budget and the operating budget in terms of how we do our our financial planning that I think has been a real hallmark of our of our financial management and, and, and um, has served us very well uh, across um, both um, boom years and bust years in the economy. Uh, and so we, we have been doing uh, real well with that. And um, another point that I'm going to mention, and Andy will get into this, but um, of course we don't have all the funds that we would like, right? We have had a lot of growth in the northern part of the city. Um, we have, have been trying to catch up the economy um, collapsed um, in uh, in about 2008 and 9, and we had some uh, some real serious uh, difficulty those years. Um, and while growth stopped during the downturn, there had been a lot of growth before that collapse, 
and there's been growth obviously occurring here again as, as uh, fortunately we've come out of um, that serious recession. Um, but we, we do have a lag in those facilities up, up north, particularly recreational facilities, as we touched on last night. And we're trying to catch up um, with that, but um, as you all uh, well know, we had a, a, a proposition on the November ballot that did not pass. That would have been an infusion of money that would have helped us um, in, in catching up there. Uh, but um, we're going to be doing our best, and Andy's going to go through how we have uh, done some reprioritization within our capital budget and trying to force... Um, the dollars uh, into the areas that we need them, um, and uh, and I think uh, he's, he and his staff have done a, had an excellent job with that. Um, and I should say it's a it's a collaborative effort on the capital side, just as it is on the operating side. We have a team approach uh, to putting the budget together, um, and and that shows in what Andy's about to present. There's also a team approach, talking about uh, leadership and image is one of the council goals. A team approach in how we work regionally, uh, intergovernmentally on. Um, bringing as much money as we possibly can um, to, to the city of Peoria from those regional, state, and national uh, funding sources. So we continue to be uh, aggressive there, and you just think about the Maricopa Association of Governments, for example. Um, a number of us, uh, elected officials and staff, are involved in, um, in, in different places in their processes, um, but all uh, for the purpose of uh, maximizing the return uh, back to the city of Peoria from uh, from those sources of funding that come to us from the federal level uh, and the state level as well. And we've been uh, successful at that, as Andy will touch on, and we will uh, continue to stay very aggressive in, in making sure that we put the city's interest um, forward uh, whenever there's funds available. Uh, we, we go after them uh, aggressively. So uh, with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Andy Granger. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Mayor and Council, I'm happy to present our 10-year proposed capital program for fiscal year 18 through 27. As we've done, I think it's been five or six years now that we've formatted our presentation uh, this way, and so we're con continue with it for this year. Uh, our agenda is going to consist of a CIP budget overview, where we talk a little bit about our funding sources and our 10-year capital program, the history of the 10-year capital program. Uh, go on to accomplishments that we've achieved over the last year. Uh, then go into projects under construction that will start either have started or will start very soon, and or in next fiscal year. Uh, the projects in design our new fiscal year 2018 projects that are in the budget. And then lastly, our traditional community works program that's been really effective. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail at the end. And again, like Carl said, um, if you have questions when we're bringing up projects, um, I'm happy to answer them then. And then at the end, we'll, any remaining questions that we have, we can answer at the end, the uh, projects that we won't cover. For our CIP budget overview, we've got to have our obligatory uh, pie chart and bar chart. So here's our pie chart that shows our multiple CIP funding sources. I just wanted to note um, real quickly that uh, impact fees, uh, general obligation bonds, revenue bonds, and enterprise funds make up a majority of this. So if there's any kind of an impact based on state legislation, um, it can impact. Th those four funding sources make up over 75% of our capital program. So if there is a change in legislation uh, uh, based on those four funding sources, it can have an impact on our, uh, on our uh, capital program. And this shows our, our 10 year history for our, our, our capital program. Um, this is the 10 year budget for the last 10 years. Um, you can see it's a somewhat of a, a significant jump from fiscal year 17. There's a couple uh, reasons for that. As uh, Katie mentioned last week, our innovation center, our proposed innovation center parking garage was not in the capital program last year, but it was for the, for the year before that. Um, we also um, had additional outside sources that were success we were successful in uh, gaining funding from, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail on uh, one of the next slides. And then lastly, the carryovers. So um, we've had carryovers from last year that uh, we didn't spend all the funds. It's, it's difficult to uh, uh, spend all the funds from a certain year, so they carry over to the next year. And so that's what's happened from fiscal year 17 to 18. A little bit more than it has in the past. But you can see from fiscal year 16, we had a $645 million capital budget, and it's $659 million this year. I think a lot of that has to do with increased property values and increases in, in sales tax revenues also. 
just wanted to share a little bit of good news on some of those outside funding sources uh, go, uh, that we achieved. Uh, one of them uh, was it's the first time that we've really worked with, uh, well, we work with the Department of Transportation, Maricopa County <laughs> Department of Transportation. This is the first time that they've agreed to fund uh, specific projects that uh, we will annex into the city once they're complete. So the first one is our Pinnacle Peak Road project from 91st to 99th. It's in a rural road condition right now. The Meadows is developing to the south of this project and they're responsible for the half street development on the south side of Pinnacle Peak Road. But the, the north half would have maintained, uh, stayed in its existing condition, which is a, is a rural road condition. We went and talked to the county and uh, they agreed to fund a, a major portion of this, 95% of this project. The only thing that they won't fund is landscaping and street lights, which is not part of their standards. But the rest of it they will fund uh, with the agreement at the end of the project that uh, we'll take it over, annex it in, and, and maintain the roadway for the future. And then with the success of that agreement, we came uh, to council and agreed with the, the, the Department of Transportation also on the Happy Valley Parkway project. Our capital project last year was only from Lake Pleasant Parkway to the Agua Fria Bridge. We went to the county and said, is there any opportunity that uh, you want to add on to the, our project and, and we'll increase our scope and go all the way over to Loop 303? Um, they agreed to that. We're going to manage the projects. There won't be any impact on schedule or coordination, but they're agreeing under a similar concept to fund $2.6 million, which will fund a majority of that project as well. Uh, so it adds on to our project and then we'll um, uh, annex that portion of, of the roadway into the city and maintain it also. Um, secondly, uh, the Flood Control District just recently agreed uh, we submit for grant funds opportunities every year and we've uh, submitted on the Section 12 drainage project which is also called our 67th and Pinnacle Peak drainage project. Uh, we've submitted for the last several years and weren't successful in obtaining funding. This year we were uh, approved for funding. Um, we have to come up with an alternative design concept, which is our final design concept, and I'll go into that in a little more detail <laughs> further in the presentation. But they've agreed to fund 50% of the ultimate construction of the drainage improvements along 67th and Pinnacle Peak. That could be up to $7 million. So um, that's a real big coup for us also. And then lastly, um, you remember the, the census uh, funding issues that we had with other municipalities across the valley. Uh, where we finally were agreed uh, we were going to get reimbursed in $1.5 million uh, for our expenses for that census, uh, the, the census uh, that we conducted. But we were, uh, that all was agreed upon that that would come in federal funding. So then our, our next um, uh, issue that we had to do is find a project that we could put that on. Um, well, we've su su successfully allocated that $1.5 million um, and, and put that on our 75th Ave intersection projects. So what that's going to be able to do is we're going to be able to take $1.5 million in local funding off of that project and be able to allocate it towards other projects within our capital program. So between these three uh, different uh, bullet points, uh, that uh, is an additional $14 million in outside funding to our capital program. That is what, another reason that our, that, our, that our capital funding is, is increased this year. Congratulations. Thank That's you. really good news. <laughs> The not so good news uh, over the past year, <laughs> as Carl referred to, is the, our, our local proper, uh, Prop 400 initiative uh, did not pass. Uh, and that could have supported additional quality of life projects, obviously, that included additional open space initiatives, additional trails projects, uh, and the Northern Recreational and Aquatic Center that, was proposed, uh, that were proposed at the, the Northern Community Park as well as auto district improvements were not, be able to, were not able to be funded or included in the, the completion of the construction of the, the auto improvement districts as part of our capital program. Um, secondly, uh, the Meadows Park, uh, over the past year we've been working with uh, Community Southwest uh, regarding the, the park improvements uh, and, at the Meadows and uh, the development agreement said that impact fees were supposed to support that uh, pr uh, park as, as they could. Unfortunately, with the legislation that was passed several years ago that restricted our, or limited us as far as how much we could charge for impact fees, especially for parks projects, that had a direct impact on this project. And so we've had to increase our funding towards this project to the tune of $4 million. That project is supposed to, that, and that we'll fund that project in fiscal year 19 and 20. But that $4 million, we had never, we didn't anticipate, we thought impact fees would be able to cover that. And then lastly, um, our 99th and Olive Avenue neighborhood park that we'd had on our program for the last several years. Um, and community services had, had thought we had a site at the uh, southeast corner of 99th and Olive. Uh, 
that was private property that we, were, uh, we had believed that we were going to be able to have donated to us. Well, we went out and did uh, some geotechnical investigations on that property, and we found a significant amount of municipal solid waste uh, on that property, throughout the property, um, that reached depths of 30 feet in some cases, and for the most part, over 20 feet deep in, in most of those locations. So, obviously not a suitable site for a community or a neighborhood park. Um, we looked at other opportunities within the Pine District for a neighborhood park, and, and what we ultimately decided that uh, the biggest benefit uh, would be to improve Country Meadows and add additional amenities at Country Meadows. So we shifted a portion of the funding from that 99th and Olive Neighborhood Park over to Country Meadows to add additional amenities and refresh existing amenities for that park. Next, we'll go on to accomplishments, unless anybody has any questions. Good to go. Uh, the first project we want to talk about is our Pinnacle Peak Public Safety uh, Building expansion. Uh, we're in the process and, and, and getting ready to, to finalize or finish off our, our public uh, safety building. The initial 17,000 square foot building has been designed to be expanded to a 30,000 square foot building in the future as we grow to the north. Um, but the initial, uh, si the initial building will be able to uh, fulfill our needs for the next five to ten years. Uh, for the police department. We are targeting LEED Gold certification on the building as we have in the past for all of our new buildings throughout the city. Um, and uh, obviously this will ha house the growth of, of, of our police department as we continue to grow to the north. The building is expected to be complete this summer in 2017 and we anticipate the move in for the police department in, in September of 2017. And we, we're happy to report that the, but we're on budget uh, for the total cost of $11.6 million. A sister project to the uh, Pinnacle Peak Public Safety Facility was, is the uh, Pinnacle Peak Road and 102nd Avenue widening project uh, that was just recently completed. Uh, the project uh, provides secondary access to paved access to the, to the backside of Pinnacle Peak, uh, the Pinnacle Peak Public Safety Facility uh, along 102nd Avenue. Um, it, it, uh, it improved the south side of Pinnacle Peak Road, its ribbon curb and sidewalk along that south side with street, street lights, sidewalks, and a DG path also. Uh, it also went uh, and extended all the way over to 99th Avenue, so we widened out uh, a portion on the east side uh, through a, a development agreement with, uh, with the adjacent development there. Uh, the total project cost for this was $2 million, and I'm happy to report that this was, uh, we, were up for, we returned to the capital program $400,000 in savings on this project. Um, our P83 Entertainment District improvements, uh, we continue to complete our Phase 2 improvements. Uh, we extended enhancements along Arrowhead Fountain Center Drive and Paradise Lane with, uh, with landscape enhancements, wayfinding, uh, a signage uh, pr predominantly throughout that area. And we also just recently refreshed the plaza across from Harkins Theater, um, which was a significant accomplishment. And we had installed, as you can see in the, in the picture to the right, uh, the 83rd Ave gateway features uh, just south of Bell Road and, and, and north of the Skunk Creek Bridge. We completed this project in February 2017. The only uh, remaining portion of this project is the, uh, the bridge, which we anticipate construction to start right after spring training. We didn't really want to disrupt the, the, the spring training traffic uh, with the, this construction of this bridge. So this will start immediately after spring training. We do have a, a separate project for the freeway signage, for the P83 free, freeway signage, which will continue. We've got some property issues right now that we're trying to resolve to, before we install those freeway signs. And Excuse me. This is improvements, aesthetic improvements, to the, our typical P83 uh, aesthetic improvements that we're going to put across to improve the aesthetics of the Skunk Creek Bridge along 83rd Avenue. And we're happy to report that this project was on budget to, to, to the tune of $4 million also. As you all know, our, we uh, completed our Peoria Cove uh, Kids Zone area at the sports complex. Uh, the theme play area uh, featuring a miniature baseball field, uh, a shaded dining area, and a play structure splash pad uh, in, the, in the form of a ship has been completed. And I think it's getting a lot of use this spring training. Uh, it was completed in December of 2016 and obviously uh, open for, for the spring training this year. Uh, and we were on budget for this project also at, uh, at $1 million. 
And lastly, our Lake Pleasant Parkway sidewalk project. Uh, we were missing uh, significant amounts of gaps in sidewalk along both sides of, of Lake Pleasant Parkway. Um, this side we, we uh, went forward with and completed first. Uh, it was easier because of right of way and, uh, that we needed to acquire on the east side. Uh, that will be the next project that we pursue. Um, but we did complete this project from Deer Valley all the way up to Hatfield Road. And we refreshed, refreshed the landscaping adjacent to Ironwood Village and, and Melton Ranch and installed new LED street lights where we, where we had to relocate to street lights along this section also. This was completed in December of last year for a total project cost of $712,000. I guess we have one more. 70, our, sorry. <laughs> our 79th Avenue and uh, Thunderbird Road in, improvements uh, were completed in July of 2016, last summer. Uh, you can see the before and after pictures of uh, w one of the, the main issues was uh, the, the through lanes were conflicting uh, along 79th Avenue from going from north to south or south to north. So you can see how the through lanes are, are now aligned more, uh, more properly and we've got dedicated right turn lanes in each direction also. So what we did is we constructed the missing east half uh, street improvements along 79th Ave south of Thunderbird Road, uh, which helped allow us to, with the space to align the, the, the through lanes on the, along 79th Avenue. And we, there were, we also completed traffic signal upgrades. Um, we had received numerous complaints before we constructed this project, and I think everybody, I've, I've heard nothing but uh, good things about uh, what, what was the result of this project. Uh, the total uh, project cost for this was $803,000, which uh, equated to a savings of $310,000. A lot of that had to do with us working with the, the Southeast property owner and having him dedicate the right of way instead of us having to purchase it. And uh, the agreement was, if he dedicated it, we wouldn't provide any uh, rep uh, repayment agreements or uh, place any repayment agreements on his property for the improvements. And uh, it was a good de deal both ways. We saved money and he got the improvements adjacent to his property. Good. Next, we'll go to projects under construction. Our first project is our 75th and uh, Cactus Road intersection project. Uh, this project has, will provide two through lanes in each direction, bike lanes in each direction, uh, dual left turn lanes and dedicated right turn lanes. It's, it's, it's primarily a safety improvement project uh, that will provide raised medians for access control, but it'll also install storm drain and water line, uh, older storm drain and water line throughout this intersection so that we don't have to go back up, go back after we tear up the intersection or after we uh, construct the intersection and, and tear it up if, if we have a failing water line. Uh, right of way acquisition is almost complete. Uh, it was a little bit uh, longer of a process than we anticipated from all the commercial properties, but we're, we intend to start construction uh, hopefully in June of this year. And we estimate the completion to take about a year and a half uh, till, so it'll be complete by the fall of 2018. Our uh, project budget for our IGA, uh, the federal funding for this project, which is Highway Safety Improvement Funds, is $6.6 .6 million. And Peoria's local allocation towards that is two, or local budget is $2.9 million for a total of $9.5 million. We've already reduced the budget on this by $800,000 with that census funding, but we think we'll be able to reduce it further once we get further along in the project and we're more comfortable with the undergrounds being relocated. So just a quick question on the reduction of the 800000 That's really just kind of a savings off of the project itself. We didn't have to pull anything out of the project to get it down 800000 no, so we didn't have to pull anything out of the project. Okay, yeah, right. this is okay. based on the census funding and our comfort level with where we are with our, our contractor and uh, on, on costs. Just clarify. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, sister project to that is our 75th and Peoria intersection project. This also received federal HSIP funds several years ago. Uh, it, impro it provides similar improvements to 75th and Cactus. And again, um, because we're conducting these at the same time, we have some efficiencies. Uh, our right-of-way acquisition, again, is almost complete on this project. We intend to construct these projects at the same time. We think it'll be easier for traffic control, and we're not going to go in and complete one intersection and then uh, go in right afterwards, and everybody thinks that the, the intersection's complete, and we're going down a mile to the north and, and starting a second intersection project. Uh, so we, again, estimate construction to start on this project in June, uh, and estimated completion for this project is the same time of fall of 2018. And once we start, we have a, a public information company that will be and has been intimately involved and in, in going to businesses uh, and informing of them of where we are and, and on the progress of the project and we'll continue that through construction to make sure that we um, address any construction concerns that they have. 
Council Member Hunt. So Andy, will the road essentially be torn up and being worked on for this long period of time? Or does this take into consideration planning and everything? So, it, it, yeah, so we've already, the planning and design is it's almost done. complete. Um, the right-of-way acquisition is almost so complete. So how so long it's, are we looking at? So it'll be, you know, 12 to 15 months of construction. And that'll be, there'll be varying degrees of construction. First they start with the undergrounds, and then they go into the surface improvements. But there will, there will be traffic control but in they place. they big trenches to they, put the underground, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it, if you can avoid the intersections, it would it'll, be. It'll be worth it. Uh, I wise, yeah. Along there yeah. I mean, we, we had a similar intersection improvement project, 75th and Thunderbird, yeah. that uh, once complete, great project, but uh, sure. it took Nobody us a while to complete. Yeah. <laughs> well, a few maybe. Any questions on this project? Um, another roadway project in the in the Pine District, our 99th Ave reconstruction project from Butler to Olive. Um, we're finalizing the design the design for this project. It'll raise the roadway profile to prevent the flooding that you see in the in the the, bo the bottom picture here on the slide. Uh, again, this is uh, kind of evident of the municipal solid waste that is in this area. So on both sides of this roadway and underneath this roadway is a significant amount of municipal solid waste that was unregulated through the history of the you know, the last 40 to 50 years. So um, that's some of the settlement that you see here is a direct result of that. So what we're going to go and do, and do is remediate the top five, remove the top five feet of the, of a, the section of roadway that's under, that has that municipal solid waste below it and reconstruct that with a more structural, structurally stable section so that it won't settle like it has in the past. Uh, we'll inst also install new sidewalk on the east side of this street. Uh, but I want to make everybody aware that this, uh, the only way to perform this construction, we can't really provide a detour on this project. So we're going to close this roadway. It's not a, a well-traveled roadway, but we want, our proposal is to, to close this roadway for the three months that it's estimated to, to complete the construction. We think it'll be easier. If we didn't close the roadway and we, we tried to provide a detour, we're probably talking nine to 12 months for the construction of this. So it's just easier to close it. So where's this white car? Still there. <laughs> it's underwater now. Yeah. No, I mean, so the, seriously, it's on 99th south of Olive? Yeah. That, yeah. That so the, flooding occurred? Primarily, the, the first 1,000 feet south of Olive is mm -hmm. where the settle, most of the settling is. So that is where we're going to re reconstruct 99th Ave along that section and, and repave it. Um, the rest of the roadway south of there is really just a mill and overlay. Um, that section isn't as bad. So you're going to dig down and take all of that out? We'll take all of the, we'll take out five feet of, of the fill and municipal solid waste that is there and rebuild it with a structural backfill that will support that roadway. All right. Council Member Hunt? What exactly is municipal solid waste? Or do it, I know it's, it's your household waste. Okay. So is it kind of landfill or these were, this, this was is all agricultural. So is it manure and? Things like that, or is it just they buried their their garbage? Because it's mostly trash debris, is what we found when we did the geotechnical investigation. So it's it's all of your household waste, uh, primarily that you'd, you'd find in a, in a your standard typical landfill. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, because this is really close to the park in Pine that you can't do. Right. Because that goes down thirty feet. Seriously, how yes. did they dig that deep? Well, I think they, I think it was that, that deep at one point and, and they, they filled, filled in that whole area. Yeah. And that's really interesting. Yeah. I would like to note that this will not prevent flooding of this roadway from a hundred year flood, but it's going to prevent, you know, your, your more standard 25 year floods, your more frequent floods that would, that will prevent flooding that, you know, this, this floods very frequently with just your normal rain events right now. And that this will this these, this, these improvements will help that. Good. Um, our project budget for this is, uh, is uh, for fiscal year 18, is $600,000. Our total project bu budget is $1.3 million, but we reduced this project budget by $500,000 by some of the value engineering that we did on, on, the, on evaluating the geotechnical aspects of this project and only doing the first 1,000 feet with the, this five-foot of structural backfill. So 
So an adjacent project is our 103rd Avenue improvements from Northern to Olive, which will widen out um, 103rd Avenue to uh, provide two lanes in each direction with a raised landscape median. Um, the pro this project, uh, you know, is a, is relatively clo or really close to our 99th Ave project. So what our anticipation is uh, we're finalizing design and land acquisition for this project, but we don't want to start construction on this project and we're done until we're we're done with our 99th Ave project. So we anticipate starting construction on this project in the fall of 2017 and estimate uh, completion on this project by the fall of 2018. That's a little deceiving. Um, the roadway construction won't take 12 months, but there's drainage improvements that we're going to do along this project. And the outfall of this is into uh, the uh, the Agua Fria to the or to the New River to the to the east of it, um, and we need to provide or we need to obtain an Army Corps of Engineers permit for that, and that's typically been taking up 12 months. So that's why we estimate the fall of 2018. This will be open for, from construction probably six months earlier than that fall of 2018 uh, date. The project budget for this is uh, $4.8 million uh, for fiscal year 18, and the uh, total project budget is $5.5 .5 million. I'd also like to note uh, the Sutton property is the property on the northeast corner of 103rd and Northern, and uh, this project will provide the, the, the total street improvements along this entire section, except for that Sutton property. Uh, they refused to donate the right of way to us, and we're asking for a significant amount of money for the right of way acquisition. So, and, there's municipal solid waste under that property also. So it, it didn't behoove us to, to buy that property or acquire that property, but we're, we're designing it to uh, transition into the, that section of roadway. Another project in construction, this actually just began this month and is expected to be complete by the end of August, is our 75th, 75th Avenue and Deer Valley Trailhead project. Uh, it's a new trailhead connection to our, our New River Trail at Deer Valley. Uh, it'll include parking, uh, shaded rest areas, a chilled drinking fountain, and uh, waste receptacles. And you can see the rendering there at the bottom of the slide. Uh, our project budget for this is, our total project budget is $1.1 $1 .1 million, and the fiscal year 18 budget is $400,000. Our Beardsley Road Channel Project from Lake Pleasant Road to 111th Avenue is uh, finalizing design and, uh, and land acquisition. Uh, we're currently amending uh, our Ventana Lakes MOU or, or, or making efforts to amend our, our Ventana Lakes MOU for uh, maintenance responsibilities along this section. Uh, what, it, what the project does is it uh, pipes the existing earthen channel on the south side of Beardsley Road and inst will install a 10-foot sidewalk and landscaping associated with that, uh, that tiling. And we'll also refresh the DG in the median and along the north side so that this uh, looks consistent across this section. And we'll paint the walls on the south side of Beardsley that are within city's jurisdiction. We anticipate construction uh, to, to begin in the summer of 2017 and be completed uh, by the spring of 2018. But I, this is all predicated on the Ventana Lakes MOU uh, being completed. And there's, there's some maintenance responsibility issues that we're um, arguing over right now, but when that's complete, we'll start the construction on this project. Oh, yes, Vice Mayor, do you have some comments about this? <laughs> I do. I just want the residents of that area to know that, that the delay in, in this project, you know, it's been a long time in coming, and most of the delay is attributed to the Ventana Lakes HOA at this point. Um, we were ready to go with this project uh, over a year ago, but because of some issues with the MOU, uh, we've had to pull it back, but I, we're on the right track to get this started. But I just want everybody to know that we are dedicated to getting this completed as quickly as possible. And your work on this has been remarkable, and the, the attorneys as well. I, I know that the, we've been really working hard to get this completed. So thank, thank you. you. Go ahead. Uh, we had a, a little bit of a discussion on this yesterday, but our residential road uh, rehab and preservation project is also, uh, we've got funding in this year for this project uh, program. Uh, the, the, the program provides local road maintenance and, and uh, rehabilitation, and uh, uh, it, it consists of patching, surface treatments, mill and overlays, or, or, and in some cases, full depth uh, removal of damaged asphalt, depending on the pavement condition. Uh, the targeted areas for, for fiscal year 2018 include uh, the subdivisions of West Green Estates, Foxborough Countryside Manor, 
Monroe Park Estates, Alta Loma, Cedar Brook, and uh, some various other locations. And like we said uh, yesterday, it's also, uh, there's additional funding, and when we get the pavement assessment report back from the Public Works is currently conducting in, in the fall, we'll evaluate and uh, prioritize the other local uh, subdivisions that, uh, that also need uh, pavement maintenance. Um, I'd like to note that the fiscal year 18 budget is $5.7 million, which is an increase in uh, $3 million over the fiscal year 17 allocation for fiscal year 18. So we almost doubled the budget, uh, or we actually more than doubled the budget uh, from last year's allocation for this year. So we should be able to get 50% more roadways done, um, which is a, a, a credit to our budget department. We had a, a highway user revenue fund surplus that we were able to allocate. We also allocated uh, in fiscal year 20 $5.7 million, which is, um, uh, again, $3 million normal than our typical every other year $2.7 million. I really appreciate you doing this. I know, that, I mean, this is one of those things that, that people see every day and it bothers them when, it, when it's something that they can't um, take pride in, in their neighborhoods, and we want them to take pride in their neighborhoods. So I really appreciate you adding more budget to this. And um, I'm interested to see the pavement assessment report because in my mind, I always thought that we started at one end of the city and continued north and then started back over again. And, um, but I, I realize now that that's not the way we do this, that we look for things that, um, what needs to be replaced, what can be repaired and, and do things on an as needed basis. So I would love to be able to see how that system works and um, then be able to, to let our citizens know how it works too because I think if they, if they knew where they were in that line, it would help them to understand the whole process and, and help them to know when their turn is going gonna, is gonna to happen. Sure. Yes. Yeah, I just want to agree with, with what you just said. This is one of the biggest issues for mm -hmm. my district and probably for Vicky's as well. We get a lot of, well, you guys know because I call you, um, we get a lot of emails that come in on the road. Can, so I really appreciate that. I'd love to see that report as well. And, and I agree with you. If they know kind of where they're at and that, system and process, um, I think it's going to make them feel a little bit better, or we can go out and explain to them why they're in that location on this. So this is, for me, this is a huge, um, a huge piece, and I really appreciate, you know, you got what you guys did there. So thank you. Thank you. Next, we're going to projects in design over the next fiscal year. Uh, one of our bigger projects in our capital program, as everybody knows, is our Northern Community Park. Uh, the phase one of this park will include lighted fields, playgrounds, a splash pad, uh, sports courts, a dog park, uh, fishing lake, ramadas, and trails, just to name a few of the amenities on, on 85 acres, which is a very similar. It's actually the same amount of acres as Pioneer Park. Uh, it's master planned also to accommodate uh, future recreational facilities to the east of the, the phase one improvements. And uh, as you may know, we have an MOU with the Flood Control District, which is the underlying landowner of this property. Uh, this is behind the New River Dam, so there we face some complexities as far as uh, regulations are concerned and uh, getting authorization to go for, forward with construction, uh, including with the Army Corps of, of Engineers as well as the Flood Control District. So we're working with them. Uh, but things so far have been progressing smoothly. We're at 60% uh, design right now. Uh, and we anticipate being complete with design by the end of the year and starting construction uh, the winter of 2017, early 2018 for a uh, target park opening of spring 2019. And a lot of that has to do with the turf grow in. Uh, some of the, a lot of these amenities will be done by the end of 2018, but uh, because of the turf and how it needs to the, the grow in, uh, we anticipate opening it in spring of 2019. Council Member Hunt? Um, are you designing it in-house, or do you have a company designing it? Yeah, we have a consultant team designing this. Um, so, no, we, I mean, we've got our architects on board that help manage that process, but uh, it's, we have a consultant team that's doing that. Good. They've waited a long time, so. Councilmember Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> we have waited a long time out there, without a doubt. And, um, Thank you for all your work on this. And I know that, you know, we've been a lot, through a lot trying to find the funding to catch up, as Mr. Swenson said. And this isn't going to quite get us there, but it's a start. And not only does it serve all of the residents in the Mesquite District and just in the northern area of Peoria, but it really does relieve those in the south whose facilities are um, just you know, overloaded by all of us 
going to that area to use those fields and parks and amenities and this is going to be the beginning of spreading all of this out for the citizens so I appreciate the optimism and this is us looking ahead and working with what we have to work with and making some things happen thank you Councilmember, just one more quick you said something is this uh, approximately the size of pioneer is it the part we're developing now or is it going to be in total so the phase one portion, you'll, you'll recognize that the funding is, is higher than it was last year. We had, uh, we've allocated over the last several years $30 million towards this park. And at that time, we didn't know where our park site was. We actually picked the, our park site early last year. And then we went through um, more detailed engineering and determined that be, um, one of the things is construction costs have started to escalate since we uh, uh, built Pioneer Park. Um, there's a hard dig condition out here. This is just north of West Wing, and there's a considerable amount of infrastructure and utilities that we've got to bring into the site. So because of that, uh, it's been somewhat of an impact on our budget, and this, the, 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 uh, the proposed or the, the projected uh, phase one construction costs for this are $40 million from $31, $30 million. So what we did is we evaluated how can we phase this park out for that and still plan for phase two infrastructure or phase two amenities and so that's what we have here is 85 acres worth of amenities for a phase one portion of the park and the next slide i'm going to show you will show what could be the phase two amenities for this park but the phase one amenities in include four ball fields they include three multi-purpose fields uh, four multi-purpose fields all of the similar types of amenities that you have at pioneer park so is pioneer about 85 it's 85 okay. acres yes that, that's what i want to know well that's a really good size park yes if and i know the rest will be built and it should be built but that's a very nice beginning that's very nice andy does um does phase one include a trailhead it does okay so you can access the the mountain from there yes What we also wanted to do is at least provide some initial funding for a phase two portion of the park. Um, so we've got renderings, as you can see in, in the slide to the right, that show what we could potentially include as far as additional amenities. Uh, the benefit of that is once we open the phase one portion of the park, we can evaluate the types of use. Are we getting a lot of use on the four ball fields? Are we getting a lot of use on the four, on the four soccer fields? Do we need additional soccer fields or do we need, you know, eight ball fields or, or what other, other additional sport courts in the, that phase two? Um, so that's one of the benefits of, of phasing this park. So here's what just a concept that you, you'll see, um, but this could change over time. And we've uh, allocated $2.5 million towards that. It won't cover the cost of these amenities, but it's, the, it's an initial start to the funding of that, those phase two improvements in fiscal year 20 and 21. Any questions? It's good to put some money in the piggy bank. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, next, our Happy Valley Parkway widening project from Loop 303 to uh, Lake Pleasant Parkway. Uh, as we stated earlier, we uh, came to agreement with the county to add that, that yellow uh, section uh, as part of the project. And so the project will widen the roadway to three lanes in each direction. Uh, right now, there's two lanes in each direction for, for most of this section. Uh, as we said, the county is going to pay for the majority of the improvements from Loop 303 to the Agua Fria. Uh, includes uh, bridge aesthetics similar to what we had on Happy Valley Road at uh, approximately 75th Avenue. Uh, and it also includes uh, bicycle and pedestrian amenities. What we're going to do is, is separate the bicycle and pedestrian amenities from with structural wall between the roadway across the bridge, which was a significant concern from the biking community. And we'll also provide signalized access or we're, we're going to pursue signalized access uh, to the Lake Pleasant Pavilion, which is the commercial, commercial center on the southwest corner of Lake Pleasant Parkway and Happy Valley Parkway. If you've ever been to uh, Lake Pleasant Pavilion, it's very difficult to get out of that commercial plaza and uh, head west on Happy Valley Parkway. Uh, so we've got a concept to, and we'll, we're going to work with the commercial property owners of the uh, pavilion to uh, provide a signalized access, which will improve the, significantly improve the access to that site and out of that site. Councilmember Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. Again, I just I want to thank you for your efforts and all of this. And um, this is um, huge for the residents of the Vistancia area because this is especially for the, the bikers, as you mentioned, because this is their only 
way in and out of the community, and it's a very active area. So um, for those on, on bicycles and those in cars and pedestrians and all of it, it's just making a huge difference for that community. And I just, I hear often um, when I'm out in the community how grateful they all are uh, for our commitment to making this happen. But I, I want to point out also what you were able to do um, as far as getting the additional funding from the, the county. It just really is a testament to uh, Peoria's effort, your leadership, and cultivating critical relationships and building trust and working together and sharing needs and identifying safety issues and, and working together to make things happen. And this is just a great example of that. And I thank you very much. I appreciate much. those comments. Thank you. So to, to give a progress update, we're at about 30% uh, design on this project. We anticipate having a public meeting this summer to, to, to present the concepts to our, our community. Uh, we have a target project completion date is for the construction of the roadway of winter 2019. That seems like a long way away. Um, the primary issue that we have that we've got plugged in our schedule is, again, Army Corps of Engineer permits. These are 4-4 permits for the bridge construction, which is a significant part of the, the, the project. Um, if that gets uh, moved up or uh, expedited, uh, then we will obviously move up uh, the construction to the schedule and this will get com completed uh, sooner. Our uh, fiscal year 18 budget is $3.8 million. Our fiscal year 19 budget is $15.2 million. So, and our total budget is $19.5 million and that, and, and that includes the county's share of $2.6 million for this project. I'd like to also just note that as part of our fiscal year 18 budget, our $3.8 million, that's design funds, we've got $1.8 million in that from our, our regional Prop 400 uh, transportation tax uh, that we get from MAG. We're, we'll get reimbursed $1.8 million that we've got allocated towards this project also. Andy, is there any possibility, I, mean, I appreciate the county giving us this money very, very much to help contribute to this um, expansion here, but is there any uh, possibility that they're doing that because they think that it can delay their um, uh, expansion or extension of Deer Valley Road across the Agua Fria? That's, uh, my understanding is, is what they're trying to do is lessen the burden of their maintenance requirements across the county. Uh, and so lo they're looking for, the other thing I, that we understand is that they're having trouble completing projects on their own. So they've got a surplus of, of funding, transportation funding to, that they need to utilize. So they're trying to find opportunities where they can partner with uh, municipalities and uh, Im make improvements to county roadways, but then also lessen the burden of the maintenance across those roadways. So I don't think it has to do with the Deer Valley Crossing. I think it has to do more with lessening the burden of maintenance responsibilities. Mm. Well, we're happy to help them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Our next project is our Section 12 uh, drainage improvements project, which is also our 67th and Happy Valley, uh, our 67th and Pinnacle Peak drainage improvements project in the Capital Book. Uh, there's two phases to this. There's the interim drainage improvements, which we're, are, are currently in the, in the study phase four, and then there's the phase two improvements, which are the ultimate improvements, as, we, as I discussed earlier on 67th and Pinnacle Peak Road. So the interim drainage improvements propose to uh, in, install basins and storm drain pipe, pipes and, and roadway, drainage roadway conveyance uh, throughout that section 12 area, which is primarily consists of custom home lots. Um, that really didn't ha have a cohesive drainage plan when they've, they've, they've been developed across the, since the, in the last 20 years. So this will help um, address some of those localized drainage concerns, these interim drainage improvements. Uh, we're, like I said, we're currently in the study phase. We have some uh, proposed um, solutions to, uh, w that consist of these amenities improvements. Uh, we are going to go back to the public. We've already conducted one public meeting. We're going to go back in, in April for another public meeting. If, uh, if we get agreement on that these will be uh, viable improvements that the, that the neighborhood will, can buy into, uh, then we'll move forward in design for those improvements. We uh, intend to finalize the interim design and then start lane acquisition and hopefully uh, complete lane acquisition by the end of 2017 so that we can be complete with those interim improvements by the, end of two, or by the uh, summer of 2018. In the meantime, we'll start the final uh, drainage, the ultimate drainage improvements along 67th and Pinnacle Peak um, starting in the next fiscal year. So our 
project budget for this in fiscal year 18 is 3.5 million. Uh, in fiscal year 19 is 2.4 million. Uh, fiscal year 20 is, is 10.7 million for a total of 16.7 million dollars. Sounds like a lot. Last year it was very similar uh, price tag, but uh, it didn't include any outside funding sources. And this year, uh, seven million dollars of that is allocated towards uh, the county flood control district's participation. It's all right, Councilmember Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. Um, again, thank you for um, moving this project forward. I, I, you know, you're the the flood expert and the road expert and all of that. Um, but I'd like to think that um, I know people. And when I first uh, became the council member for the Mesquite District at that point, um, I started meeting a lot of people out in this area. They were very, very passionate about what they were going through out here and angry and upset and there was a breakdown in communication even in the neighborhoods and people weren't talking and you all Peoria basically uh, there were so many factors that went into causing these problems and that created these issues and Peoria has really stepped up in a big way to bring these people together and identify these issues and get their input and come up with solutions and funding and um, this is going to change their lives, and we're doing it sooner than later, and they're grateful, and I'm very grateful, and I can't wait to share these details with them. Thank you. Thank you. Our next project is our Thunderbird Road uh, corridor improvements project. Um, last year, I think we called this our 83rd and Thunderbird intersection improvements project. Um, this project we've uh, revised a little bit from uh, the scope of work that we had last year and that's uh, primarily because we conducted a traffic study this year just to look at the effects of widening out the 83rd Avenue and Thunderbird Road intersection versus doing some other smaller improvements that might be as impactful as far as relieving the congestion throughout this area. Um, some of those improvements include modifying the signal timing uh, to provide a left turn movement on Thunderbird uh, to north on 83rd Avenue to provide a leading left as well as a lagging left. We don't have that type of programming anywhere else in the city, uh, but this will provide an opportunity to uh, relieve that left turn queue pocket in, in two different cycles during the, the, the same, well, during the, two different periods during the same cycle. Um, so that we're gonna provide those signal improvements in the near term, as soon as spring training's over, we'll, we'll conduct those uh, signal improvements. So that be, will be an immediate impact to that, that intersection. And then, over the long term, we're going to increase the left turn storage pockets at uh, Loop 101 and at 83rd Avenue, as well as uh, provide a dedicated right turn lane for that southbound 83rd Avenue to um, eastbound Thunderbird or we uh, westbound Thunderbird Road uh, movement. Um, but those we'll have to we'll have to uh, hire a design consultant for, and then uh, and then when we finalize the design, we'll go to construction. Uh, we anticipate those improvements to be complete by the fall of 2018. Um, our project budget for this is uh, for fiscal year 18 is $2 million, uh, and our total project budget, including that study, is $2.1 million. But uh, you may recall last year this was a $4 million project, so through that study, uh, we feel that these improvements will be just as impactful as widening that project for half the price. Wow. Good. No, uh, just a quick comment. I, I, we had discussed this, and if we can have the same impact and spend less money, for the taxpayers put that money someplace else i'm all for it so i think that's i think that's good stuff yeah everybody's a winner so uh, will the um construction impact be less yes the the, the construction ha impact will be significantly less also and take a, a significant a, a less amount of time to to make those improvements wow great thanks vice mayor yeah, I just want to echo Mike's uh, comments. I mean, when we first started talking about this, and, uh, and I believe this was in fiscal 19 years budget originally, and I just appreciate you guys listening to us and listening to our constituents and really taking a lead and finding ways to, to bump up that time frame. And coming in in April of this year and having it completed in June is phenomenal for that, for that signal because just yesterday I was on that um, area and it took me f almost four signals to get through that, you know, that light. And so this is definitely going to help impact spring training for next year. Um, and just to, with the P83 area expanding as it is and with our innovation center, 
it, this is really just going to make it so much easier to get in and out of that area. So I appreciate everything you're doing. Thank you. Just to give an update on our Northern Parkway project, as you uh, know, this is a joint project with uh, Maricopa County Department of Transportation, uh, City of Glendale and El Mirage, uh, from Loop 303 to Grand Avenue, along Northern Avenue, which to create the parkway. Uh, then uh, we've, we've been working with uh, our partners over the last year to somewhat revise the concept for the Northern Parkway. Um, it, it, it it's. The phase one improvements were similar in, in the, the, in, to a, a freeway condition, and we were concerned about how that would look going through the city of Peoria. So we've convinced them to modify the, the concepts and the final design so that we'll have a raised, par, uh, raised, lands, raised landscape meeting through our section of Northern Parkway from 115th Avenue over to Loop 303, which is, or, or to Loop 101, which is a, the major portion of improvements that we'll have uh, west, or yeah, east of th the Loop 101 is going to primarily be the intersection improvements that are further out in our program. Uh, but that was a significant uh, uh, positive outcome from those meetings that we've had over the last year. Uh, the near-term improvements are going to include primarily uh, that impact Peoria is the Loop 101 interchange improvements uh, are scheduled. We're, we're in the process of soliciting for a design consultant. And then we'll move into construction, which potentially could start as early as uh, next fiscal year also. So to envision that, it's, it's maybe hard to look at the existing condition, the future condition of this, this interchange and see uh, much of a difference. What happens is the abutments get uh, taken out and, and made vertical. They're, they're, they slope right now. And what it does is it allows us to add a, a through lane and dual left turn lanes in each direction. And we did this uh, at, Olive, at the Olive Avenue uh, interchange in the Loop 101 as, as well as the Thunderbird Road interchange in the Loop 101 in the past, over the last five, past five years. And that's the exact same type of improvements that we'll make at, at um, Northern Avenue also. Um, the other uh, near-term improvements will be the Phase 2 Northern Parkway improvements. Most of that is outside of our jurisdiction to the west of us. Uh, but the, the Phase 2 improvements go from Dysart to 111th Avenue. Uh, that's close to being finalized and we'll move into construction probably in the summer of this uh, of this year. Um, so the, the fiscal year and, and then just to, to note the 111th Avenue to grand improvements which are more of the concern uh, specifically for Councilman Leone is those improvements won't start even design until 2022. So those improvements and the impacts on those improvements will be from 2022 to 2025. So the order is changing, the order of the improvements, instead of it all going from west to east, um, we're doing ours prior to the Dysart one happening? Uh, that not necessarily. Back? No, the order, the order hasn't changed. With the phase two improvements from Dysart to 111th, it was always that, the, the next phase of improvements. Okay. Um, and that's going, that's been delayed while we had negotiations with the partners on what the proper concepts or proper improvements were for, for the section of Northern Parkway based on traffic volumes. So that phase got delayed and is just starting up now. But at the same time, the uh, Loop 101 interchange was programmed to start right now. And so that's going to go following that phase two. And it's just for the interchange improvements, which is isolated to that area. Okay. And then the phase three improvements, which will start in 2022, is at 111th Avenue. Primarily, what we, the most impact that we'll see is from 111th Avenue to Loop 101. Okay, got it. Thank you. I'm, I'm up to date. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, the project budget for the fiscal year 18 for our contribution to this project is $1.6 million. Our total contribution uh, for the entire project is $19.1 million. That includes about $2.5 million that we've already paid into the program. Um, the overall program from all of the partner agencies is 30% of the overall construction budget. The overall construction budget is $320 million. Another trailhead project uh, that is, is currently starting is our 83rd Ave and Village Parkway trailhead. Uh, this new trailhead will uh, provide uh, parking, uh, signage, shaded rest area, and drinking fountains, and land ha landscape enhancements to the existing trail connection at 83rd and Village Parkway. We acquired the land, as you may recall, in January of 2015. Uh, design began this month on the trailhead, and we expect to open the trailhead in the spring of 2018. 
the project budget for this is $533,000 for fiscal year 18, and the total project budget is $906,000. Any comment about that? <laughs> it's good news. <clears throat> Another trailhead project that we have uh, currently ongoing is our 99th and Olive Avenue trailhead, uh, which was uh, is in the same location that we talked about with the solid waste issue that we have. Uh, this is a new trailhead for the existing New River Trail that includes similar enhancements that we talked about at 83rd and Village Parkway. <laughs> Our investigation, our geotechnical investigation, which was coincided with the, the neighborhood park geotechnical investigation, we found significant amounts of solid waste under this, uh, under this site also. But we feel that we can provide a trailhead or construct a trailhead uh, with more permeable amenities uh, across this site that aren't hardscape concrete type of amenities so that they can be flexible and take some type of subsidence if, if necessary um, due to settling. So. We still think that this is a viable site. What we want to do is uh, Phoenix had a similar type of site and a trailhead proposed at, at a site, and they were successful in, in obtaining EPA grants for site cleanup of the top five feet of their trailhead site. Uh, so what our proposal is is to do uh, pursue the same EPA grant that is due at the end of this year. Uh, so our, our proposal is to do that. Um, we also got, have land negotiations that are ongoing with the surrounding property owner, which is the Johnson family. Um, to potentially expand that area and potentially provide other passive amenities in this area um, as part of this trailhead project. So with that, if everything is successful, uh, we'll start construction. If we, if we obtain the grant or we submit for the grant, we can obtain funding, then if all goes well, we should be able to start the design of this project in, in um, early next calendar year. Our project budget for this is $1.9 million and our, our total project budget is $2 million. What does this do for connectivity for that trail? Where does, where does that trail start? So the, this, the, the trail is continuous here, but it's on the western side of the river, um, and, and the trail connection will be right there on, on, on the west side where the site is, where you see the future trailhead uh, shaded in. And it goes all the way south to Glendale? Yes, it goes through Glendale um, and continues south, um, I think down to Bethany Home. I remember doing the grand opening for that trailhead um, in Glendale along New River. Uh, I just don't know how much farther south it goes than that. It goes significantly into to, to the city of Glendale. Okay. And then, and then is this where, how far north does it go? I'm trying to find out if this, you know, how, how connected we are. We're connected uh, on the New River Trail all the way up to... Uh, not all the way up to Happy Valley. We're, we're close to, we've got several projects in our capital program to bring it all the way up to Happy Valley. I think we're up to, to Williams right now. On sure. yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. That's great. Thanks. Another project that we've uh, referenced uh, yesterday as well as last week is our Pyramid Peak Water Treatment Plant Expansion Project. Uh, this, is, this project is primarily to, to plan for future growth in, in North Peoria. Uh, it expands our portion of, of, the, of the ownership in the, in the plant uh, to increase Peoria's capacity from 11 MGD up to 24 MGD. Uh, the construction is anticipated to begin in fiscal year 2018, and uh, it's a, it's a multi-year project uh, anticipated to be complete in 2021. Our fiscal year 18 cost for the expansion is $7.9 million, and our overall project cost for our expansion is $55 million. Significant portion of our budget. Water's expensive. Next, we'll go into our, our new fiscal year 18 projects within the budget. One of the projects that was asked about yesterday was a, a landscape, and we've got three separate projects in our capital uh, program for this year. They're the 67th Ave project, our 75th Ave project, and our 91st Avenue project. Uh, all three of these projects, repair and paint, are proposed, or the scope of work is to repair and paint perimeter walls adjacent to these roadways, uh, refresh the decomposed granite, and enhance the landscaping and irrigation systems along these corridors. The 67th Ave section goes along our boundaries from Olive Ave all the way up to just north of uh, uh, Thunderbird Road. Our 75th Ave section goes from Grand all the way up to Thunderbird, and our 91st Ave section goes from Mountain View all the way up to Grand Avenue. Uh, we anticipate design and construction to be able to be both completed in fiscal year 2019. These are, are somewhat straightforward projects. Um, 
Uh, and the total project budget for all three of these projects is $2.2 million. You can see the existing conditions on, in the picture to the left and, and what we, this, the picture to the right is uh, some of the enhancements that we had made as part of our 91st Ave improvements from Butler to Mountain View that we completed uh, two years ago. Member Hunt? Well, I'm pleased this is going to get done, but it seems like the painting of the wall, which is really the egregious part, I mean, it all looks much nicer done, but is it not possible to go ahead and paint those walls separate from refreshing the landscaping? It seems to me they could be two separate projects, if you will rather than to wait another year. Yeah, I, th I, I think we could look at that approach. Okay. If, that, if that's the most important par portion of the project to get to completed early, I think uh, we can look at separating that out. Okay, I think I'm getting more and more complaints about the way South Peoria looks just driving the streets, and um, I know just that wall painting would do wonders to improve that. I don't think they're thinking about the the decomposed granite, unless it's an area where there are a lot of weeds, which we know this is weed season, but <clears throat> the wall would be a real statement. <clears throat> I'd appreciate it if you could. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Another new project to our capital program is a, a, a new proposed traffic signal on Deer Valley Road and 87th Avenue. We've experienced uh, a numerous crashes over our history at this intersection. And so um, over the last several months, we uh, conducted a traffic warrant analysis at this intersection, and it met several warrants uh, to, um, to install a signal at this location. So we've added to our capital program uh, to acquire right-of-way and install a new traffic signal. Uh, Inter just of note is the, the jurisdiction on the north portion of this intersection is in county jurisdiction, so we're going to approach the county and look and, at possibly cost sharing for this intersection or for this signal. Um, hopefully that's successful and it will lower the cost, our cost of that signal. Uh, but we anticipate adver advertising for a design consultant uh, early next fiscal year, and uh, the constructing is dependent on the right-of-way acquisition on both the northwest and the northeast corner. Um, we'll have some land acquisition concerns that uh, may take uh, some time to acquire, but uh, once that's complete, we'll go f straight into construction of the traffic signal. And our fiscal year 18 budget, uh, the total budget for this project is $627,000. Another new project to our uh, capital program is our uh, Joe Max Road improvements from Loop 303 to Vistantia Boulevard. Uh, this is a, a direct result of the rebalancing efforts of ADOT and MAG. <laughs> Um, and Councilmember Binsbacher had a, and, uh, and, and the mayor both had a lot to do with uh, the, uh, that project being put back in or rebalanced back into the, the ADOT freeway program. So thank you for that. Um, the, that project, the ADOT project, will uh, widen out Loop 303 from Happy Valley Parkway to uh, Lake Pleasant Parkway. So it will look similar to what the, the improvements look all the way from uh, loop 101 all the way over to Happy Valley Parkway across the Loop 303 section. So um, we're, we're looking forward to these improvements also uh, that will add a general purpose lane in each direction. Uh, so th right now there's two lanes um, in each direction along Loop 303, and that will provide an additional lane so that we'll have three lanes in each direction. But another significant component of that is the uh, construction of the, and it's the, the most uh, the cost, the most significant cost of those roadway improvements is actually the interchange improvements at the, at Joe Max, uh, align, the Joe Max alignment. So that is part of the ADOT project, but for them to move forward to that project, they won't, they won't go forward unless that we have a project that will connect to that interchange. So we've added this project, which will allow an additional connection for North Peoria onto Loop 303. Uh, so in order to do that, we've got to purchase the, the state land as the property owner across that right-of-way, and we'll have to coordinate that alignment with the, the APS for the power corridor. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're trying to align our project with what we believe is ADOT's schedule for design in fiscal year 2018, uh, right-of-way acquisition in fiscal year 2018 and 2019, and then construction in fiscal year 2020. Our fiscal year 18 budget is $833,000, and our total project budget is $3.8 million. Great. 
Thank you. Yes. Another new project uh, to the capital program is our Peoria Homes Alley Improvements Project. Uh, it's going to repave ex uh, five existing alleys between 75th and 73rd Drive in the Acacia District and between Desert Cove and Becker Lane. It also, uh, as part of that, it'll install a uh, ribbon curb on both sides to help uh, remediate some of the weeds that grow in that area. Uh, and it'll improve the alleyway with a, a low-maintenance roadway and improve the, you know, just the overall condition of that alleyway. Uh, we anticipate hiring a JOC contractor in the fall of 2017, and we est estimate construction uh, to take approximately three months. Uh, and our fiscal year 18 budget is $591,000 for that project. Council Member Hunt. Well, you just know I have to speak on this one, Abby. <laughs> oh, my. This is one of those that I'm going to guess eight or ten years I've worked to get the plan for those alleys. And, and others of you out there have helped me. You've said this might work and this might work and, and talked to neighbors and, and just thought so many different plans might work. And for whatever reason or another, they didn't work. And we've had probationers in there pulling weeds. And the thing is the communities, as you well know, are older communities. So they either have original owners, but they're quite elderly and they can't walk all the way around to the end because most of the homes don't have gates out the back to pull their weeds or they are rentals and they don't care to walk around to pull the weeds. So it's just been a conundrum. And finally, Andy said, oh, we could do this. It's like, where have you been <laughs> all my life, Andy? Um, and it won't cost that much, he said. So um, it's just <laughs> seriously... You have no idea how much I love this project and uh, how much I'm so happy to quit thinking about those darn alleys over there. So thank you, thank you. And, and really thank you to the 10 or 12 of you over the years who have tried to help with the alleys too because uh, they just seemed like they were going to be a gift that kept on giving. But we will conquer those alleys. Now, then I have some downtown alleys too. Just I'm just saying. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate the comments. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, another new project, uh, and we referenced this earlier with our county agreement, uh, the Pinnacle Peak Road improvements from 91st Avenue over to Lake Pleasant Parkway. Uh, this will be a developer-led project, uh, but we added it to the capital program because we will have some local contribution, although it will be a minor for the amount of uh, new roadway infrastructure that we'll get. Um, but the roadway, when completed, will uh, widen the roadway to uh, two lanes in each direction with a raised landscape median and bike lanes um, in each direction. As I, st I think I stated earlier, the developers to, it will pay for the south and construct the south half of the improvements when development occurs on, on, on those southern improvements. And right now, they're in the process of constructing that, the parcels uh, just south of uh, between 91st and 95th Avenue. And I think 95th to 99th Avenue is right behind it. So this will get improved ra rather quickly. It also includes the signal upgrades at 91st Avenue. And um, uh, this, at, again, as we stated earlier, this sit, we have agreed uh, to annex this roadway after construction uh, with that agreement with the county. Uh, the fiscal year budget is $3.6 million. Um, that's for that north half of the roadway improvements. So as I said, the south half will be uh, paid for through, uh, constructed by the developer, and they'll be repaid with impact fees. Uh, and the county shares uh, $3 million of that $3.6 million. And our last uh, agenda item is our, our traditional community works program. Uh, this program, as you know, funds smaller projects, typically less than $100,000, uh, that would not normally be included in our capital program, uh, but help to improve uh, the community significantly around them. Uh, it's been a, su a very successful project over the last uh, 10 years that I've been here. Uh, the types of projects include signing, striping, and traffic control, uh, minor roadway improvements, bike lane retrofits, uh, entry monuments uh, on the engineering side, and uh, right-of-way landscape and wall enhancements, shade structures, and, and tree replacements on the community services side is some of the types of typical types of projects that we have in the, in the program. 
Some examples of recently completed projects over the past year include our Olive Avenue Utility Undergrounding Streetlight Infill Project that I'll go into a little bit more detail on, uh, our Country Club Parkway uh, Privacy Wall Improvements, uh, Vistanche Entry Monuments, our 91st Avenue Sidewalk uh, from, Happy, uh, from Hatfield to Happy Valley Road, uh, Community Garden Improvements, a new scoreboard at Murphy Park, and right-of-way improvements at 75th and Surrey. One of the projects that was recently completed was the Olive Ave Utility Undergrounding and Streetlight Infill Project. It sounds like a bigger project than uh, $100,000, but we were able to capitalize on some SRP aesthetic funds that we uh, have. Um, so we buried the overhead power on Olive Avenue between 85th Avenue and 91st Avenue along the south side of Olive. Uh, we removed the uh, abandoned poles and the telecommunication lines and installed new LED streetlights as part of that project. So now when you uh, travel along Olive Avenue through that section, you won't see those over overhead power lines. That was just accomplished over the last month. As I said, the SRP aesthetics uh, portion of that project was $421,000 and the city's portion was $93,000. That undergrounding those power lines makes such a big difference uh, to those to those neighborhoods. I really am, am pleased that you did this and also pleased to know that SRP has aesthetic funds because <laughs> because there's lots more places we can use those. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. We also completed privacy wall improvements at uh, along Country Club uh, Parkway from 85th Avenue to, uh, to the Union Hills uh, Drive area. Uh, those included uh, repairing cracks along that, uh, th those walls and then repainting them along that section. And you can see what the existing condition looked like before we painted the walls and then the, the, the condition after we painted the walls. It really made it a significant improvement to that area. Uh, we received a lot, a lot of comments from residents that came out and, and, and provided a lot of compliments while we were uh, painting those, those walls. And our project cost for that was $23,000 out of our community works program. Oh, Vice Mayor. Sorry. Andy, I just, again, I want to compliment your, your team. Um, I probably had over 50 emails from residents in that area. Um, the amount of work and the time that it took was minimal, but the impact was huge. And whatever we can do to add to this budget throughout the city, um, these, little, these little improvements make every area look so much more attractive with minimal effort on our part. So again, I want to commend you, but you know, Carl, I don't know what our budget is for wall painting, but if we could up it a little bit, um, I, I would like to do something like that. Wall painting budget? Yeah. Absolutely. We could look at that. We're going to show you what our community works allocation is at the, at the end Perfect. of this, so we can probably have a conversation at that time. Uh, we installed two Vistantia entry monuments, our typical uh, Peoria entry monuments that are, are throughout, we've installed throughout the city. Uh, the two new ones are on Vistantia Boulevard and Lone Mountain Parkway. Uh, we installed those, uh, it was approximately two months ago where they were completed, and uh, the project cost for those was $118,000. We also installed the gazebo as part of the community services community works program uh, at the community garden and the project cost for this was $6,300 and then just uh, provided an additional amenity at our community garden. So as I stated, here's the breakdown of uh, our allocation for um, our community works program. <laughs> Uh, we allocate $500,000 towards engineering projects, which are more of our streets projects, and they, they uh, come from our streets funds. And then our community services projects uh, allocate uh, or sum up to $500,000 also, and that comes out of our general fund, and more, uh, more our park-related and right-of-way re related uh, landscaping improvement projects. But as you see in there, uh, wall painting we did, this is the first year that we've allocated specifically $50,000 for that uh, wall painting uh, program. Uh, in the past, it's come out of quick response. We do have quick response funds of $125,000, but that's for quick response for the entire community works program. So if we wanted to have a discussion on that as far as wall painting, we can, we can probably do that right now. So this, um, as if we were channeling your thoughts as we we're putting the budget together, we, we had seen this as well, that um, there's a real impact from the wall painting, and so we had put this in there as, as an additional amount uh, to make sure that we could do more of that. You are channeling. <laughs> That's a little eerie, isn't it? <laughs> Does that sound good, Council? 
Everybody good? Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> I, I had a quick question that if you're ready to move on there. Um, Where it says Pioneer Park fencing, what would be the restroom fixtures? I thought the park was completed. Did somebody break them or? I know. John, or Chris, want to come down? You knew you'd have to come down. Good evening, Mayor and Council, and uh, Mayor and uh, Councilmember Hunt. Specifically to this item, while we've built beautiful parks, on occasion we miss something. Okay. And in this case, the fixtures within the bathrooms. You didn't put any toilets in. The toilets are in, <laughs> the water I runs. Knew there was something missing. The simple design of the sink matters. And so this is going to be a fix to that issue. And okay. it, we've received a lot of complaints. Um, and it's just one of those that you see as a plan. But when it's in 3D and really in use, it was something we have to fix. Yeah. I, I had complaints too, but they were so low on my priority list that I didn't think too much about it. But yeah, that, that's good then. I, and I get that. Excellent. I was kidding. There are toilets. Yeah. <laughs> Just to clarify. Can, can we ask questions about this? Yes. Go right ahead. Not yet. Right. Don't leave. Oh. <laughs> so retention basin improvements. We mentioned last night that there's 18 retention basins, and I noticed we've got the, the list. So out of all this list, are these all city maintained, or are these all under MIDS? No, so the list, we have the retention basins, uh, which are all maintained. Okay. The retention basins with park-like amenities, which are also city maintained. Mm -hmm. Now, the MIDs, the maintenance improvement districts, are set up a bit differently in that they are a taxable uh, area. So that area is basically retro based upon the service level and the taxation. So that's done annually as part of uh, the tax levy for those areas. But all of them, in essence, are maintained by the city. It's just how we fund them. So that is part of what you have here in addition to the community works, the refresh, and if you'll recall the past couple of years, we've had a number of uh, mids or basins or uh, these sort of common areas that are owned by the city, not necessarily the neighborhoods, that with a fresh coat of decomposed granite, rock, uh, some fresh landscape material, plants, and a good cleanup really makes a difference, just like the, the, the walls. Uh, and, and right away areas. So this is a capacity for us to accomplish even more of that. So how often do you look at, for, for, for the ones that are under the mids, um, because I know that the one I'm specifically was talking about was the one on uh, 85th and Grover's and Westerfield that we just recently did in, in my area. But um, there are others in here that probably, how long has it been since they've been refreshed? Because we're collecting money that's going into a fund for the eventual Re refreshment of that um, retention basin. Are there some here that have not been refreshed in some time? How often do you review them? Because I, I've watched, you know, I've watched the maintenance teams go out there and do what I call a go and blow, and they spend less than 15 minutes maintaining it. But then I see the cost because I, we had this discussion um, several months ago. I saw the cost associated with the maintenance of it. And it was interesting to see how much money they were, they were charging us to maintain it for spending 15 minutes a month doing the maintenance or a week doing the maintenance. So I'm just really concerned about some of the other mids or some of the other retention basins and all the other districts. Are they getting looked at to make sure that they're looking as fresh and new as they possibly could if we have the money for them? Because it looks like we, I don't know what the dollar amount that we're collecting for them, but I'd like to see that too maybe how much money we have in these mids for these particular basins. Yeah, maybe the thing for us to do, because that sounds like a, a bit more of an expansive question, a good one, yeah. um, but let us um, look into that and sure, maybe absolutely. delineate um, by, by each individual basin um, how much is being spent there on an annual basis, how often they're getting there, uh, that kind of thing. Well, I wasn't kind expecting of, anything tonight. It's just yeah, okay, something okay. we need to look at. I, I, I'd like to see, you know, what we're, what's being expended <laughs> on the, the maintenance on it. And if we've collected $50,000 over the course of a 10-year 
because I know the ones in my area were 27 years old and we had, had collected about $80,000 and never done any maintenance or any improvements to it. And so we spent, what, $20,000 of this, of the 80,000 that had been collected to refresh it and it looks brand new. Okay. So if we could do that or do that kind of comparison to the rest of them, if, they're, if it's warranted, I, I think it would mean a lot to the areas that, that have them in their neighborhoods. Okay, good. Let us get a report back to you on, on all of that. Okay. Right. Good. And that is what the capacity within the community services, uh, community works program uh, provides us the ability to do sort of that. That assessment gives us the capacity to address the areas that need it. And we'll get a, a further detail on that assessment for you and uh, similar to this information okay. that next layer. Yeah, like I said, no hurry. I just I was gonna say, and, and we also have that project that's there, that item that was in the operating budget to add on those those mid, yes. you know, to put them in here and put some funding towards that as well. Yeah. So it'll be a matter of going out and assessing the condition, sure. you know, similar, and providing kind of a, a plan in place sure. and utilizing funding over the next few years to get hit, hit as many of them as we can. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy. Council Member Hunt. <clears throat> okay, I have several, and Andy, you might, one of these might be coming up or might have been in last year's budget, but I'm looking at landscaping. John, I don't know if you should go away yet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe you could, but, um, <laughs> and Carl, this might be even for you to answer. I've talked to you several times about the general lack of nice appearance of our beautiful campus here. It's not so beautiful always. I know the entrance into main library is ghetto. I mean, that's the only way to say it. It's just bad. It's dirty. It's really, it's just bad. The, there are so many places on campus where the bushes are dead or dying for sure. The decomposed granite is probably in that landfill 30 feet down because it certainly isn't apparent anymore. Um, and I, I've talked about this for a long time, and of course Eric's not here now, and I think it was his thing, but, but he's only been gone a very short period of time, and I've been talking about this for a couple of years, and I, I don't see, an, I mean, some of the buildings need painting. This campus can't get to looking shabby, and, and it does. So um, it's just tired, I guess, would be a better word. But there are some places that are really bordering on shabby. And I see we're buying one ash tree replacement for the east garage. I took pictures and had several trees that were dead as doornails removed from around this building even. And I don't see their replacements here, unless it's been so long ago that it was last year and I have forgotten. But Stuart, you seem to want to tackle that one. You're off the hook, John. Seem to want to tackle. Answer. Okay, we'll, we'll go with that answer. Um, but no, I think, um, let me see if I can address some of the issues, Mayor and Councilmember Hunt. Um, when um, probably a, a month or so ago, Carl had actually asked me as well, maybe it was as a result of some conversations with you, maybe a little further back, to sort of walk the entire campus. And, and we've, uh, my facility staff and I have done sort of a complete walk around of the entire campus, looking at everything from the, um, the directional signage at the very front of the campus. Um, to looking at how the, um, the lighting bollards, because they've been there probably 15 years, the paint on them has all started to fade because they get all hit from the sun the same direction. Two sides are good, two aren't. So we've been trying to put together sort of a comprehensive list of those projects. It's probably a couple hundred thousand dollars all in. It probably excludes a refresh of painting of all the exterior of the buildings. And so what we, what we want to try to do is work within the, this process. What are some things that, as really you all talked about earlier, get some immediate payback, whether it's refreshing some of those and some of those areas. Because some things will be seen very quickly by those that see where it's oxidized paint. Some won't be seen, but we recognize we've got some things we should be doing at the campus. We did a refresh um, in coordination with community services um, four or five months ago, maybe a little further back, related to landscaping on the exterior of the building right up against the building proper, we trimmed areas back, replaced some trees where things were dead, just took it all out. Um, that was in part to address aesthetic, but also to address security, because some of the lighting issues and the fixtures all around there, we've replaced all the lighting around all the campus um, to make sure that as folks coming through, particularly at night, they feel more comfortable walking through the areas. So we've done some things um, 
but clearly not hit all the sweet spots. Um, so I recognize that and, and we'll start working more aggressively to try to figure out a program that hits all those issues. I think, I think some of the issues too is um, ultimately trying to take off, for instance, areas where we've seen water staining on the exterior of some of the buildings where we've scrubbed some of those things down and part of it may be addressing, do we ultimately look at a repaint and a refresh of the building? I think um, the, the mayor's made a big issue and I think the whole council has of community appearance. And that may be a, it may be a broader conversation and a bigger CIP project. We can certainly work to try to develop some options that can be looked at. If you are currently doing an assessment of, of the whole campus, I think it would behoove I'd us to wait to until we have that assessment. I appreciate you working on um, things like lighting because security and safety is, is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And after that, we could talk about um, you know, whatever else we need to do to make sure that we are maintaining our, our property so that it doesn't lose its value. Um, and we have to spend more money even. So why don't we wait for that assessment and then um, make some decisions on how to prioritize those projects. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, on the entryway to the library, I may have been told, because there's a lot of money going into the uh, fix-upping of Maine. We're calling that the refresh. Refresh, okay. Um, does that c count that interior uh, en entry area outside? Mayor Councilmember Hunt, that ex is exactly um, the point of, of your concern, um, and we certainly appreciate that, that vision, and we recognize that and, and can only deal with so much with the structure and what's built there. But yes, the refresh um, is a substantial amount of uh, capital in the current capital plans, what's in this fiscal year. Um, that we will look at the study for the services and how it will can most impact uh, the users. And I think it's that first impression, so our focus will be that entryway uh, where the consumer customer touches uh, the experience at the library, if that makes sense, seats, uh, the fixtures and furniture, all the things that are most prevalently used, uh, restrooms, so those types of things are what's in this project, and I would we'll be moving that forward because of timeline, but we are working with engineering to get that project underway currently. So uh, that is um, what we will look at first and foremost. That entryway, we can only do so much with the orientation, I'm but we can the change outer. the outer side, exactly, all the way, that whole area. Now what we can do with it is part of that. So it's landscaping, so just as we have the PSAB, we've got a very large campus here. Uh, the, the landscaping there, the ash tree replacement, if you feel we need to change that and there's other areas that are priority, we can make those adaptations. Over the past couple of years, we've made a, a substantial but not a complete approach to replacing the landscaping. Uh, the walkway between the library and uh, council chambers here was done this year as well with the acacia, uh, sweet acacias that are in there, um, or that are no longer in there, and now we have the mulgas, which are a better tree. So uh, the, there's a lot of things that we have done, but we've got a lot of work more to do. Well, I would suggest as a start, somebody could power wash the inside of that entryway to the library. It's just dirty, and cokes spilled and rolled up newspapers that should be picked up by custodians every day. They've rolled up, gotten rained on, and it's just, Yucky. It doesn't even require all of your what you're saying. It requires maintenance, mm -hmm. daily maintenance, like anything else gets, or weekly, whatever it is. But then the rest also. Right. If you want to see what I see, I'll walk the campus with you. That'd be great. <laughs> I'd be happy to do it. Thank you. I'll join you in that. Okay. Good. I mean, honestly, nobody saw the giant dead palm tree in our entryway where there were three palm trees and one was totally dead okay. until I said it's dead. <laughs> All right. Well, I had more. Oh. But I, okay. might have, I might have forgotten what it is now. Um, entryway monuments. Is there anywhere in here where we're going to get any in South Peoria? That was on my list. Our uh, next proposed location is actually at 67th and Thunderbird. Uh, but if, if we're open to any other suggestions beyond that, too. I mean, what did you say? At 67th and Thunderbird. 
there we were proposing an entry monument? Yeah, I was thinking South Peoria, 67th or 75th and um, about where, where the county part ends and we're really welcoming people to Peoria. We have the nice one across from Pioneer Park. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful, but that's the only one we have at all in what I call South Peoria, which would be my district and Pine District. So yeah, anywhere in there, we need two, one 75th and one 67th. 75th and? 67th. 75th Avenue, but uh, Well, do you I'd have, have to look cross? exactly. It might be Mountain View. Mountain View might be a good place. Okay. Maybe we'll talk afterwards and yeah. about good locations. And then utility undergrounding in Old Town. I see we did utility undergrounding. I asked for this and even suggest it might be put on a 10-year plan to move it up. I know it's costly. Yes. But if, if other areas are getting it and it's costly, I sure would like to be on that waiting list. Sure. I mean, the only utility undergrounding project that we've uh, done over the last couple of years is the one on Olive Avenue. Um, we're looking at um, another one, um, but we, the, the intent of this $100,000 here is for the downtown area. Uh, but $100,000, um, you know, our typical alleyway, the, the alleyway in our Washington Street block, we anticipate costing anywhere from six hundred dollars to $900,000 to underground just that section. Mm -hmm. So it'll take a little while to, to, to get this um, fund built up. Okay, but if we can get in a five-year plan or something sure. or a 10-year plan, yeah, just so it's not overlooked. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Actually, that concludes our, our, our formal presentation, but uh, obviously there's other projects in our capital program. Um, so if there's any other specific questions you have on the capital program or any specific projects, um, I'm helping. I'm, Open to taking any questions. Council Member Patena. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I have a, a comment and a question. Um, first of all, um, Andy, thank you for the uh, completion date on the 83rd Avenue and Village Parkway trailhead. Uh, once a week I get a text or an email from somebody in Westbrook Village wanting to know when that's going to be completed and what the amenities are going to look like. Uh, Westbrook Village has plenty of walking clubs and and uh, biking clubs and they use that trailhead extensively so now i'll be able to give them an answer on when that's going to be completed so thank you and then my my question is i noticed you know most of the construction projects that i've ever been part of are either on budget or over budget and i've noticed that in your some of your project you have significant savings eight hundred thousand five hundred thousand one point three million uh, and that's amazing my question is what are you doing to generate those savings, or do they differ by project? <laughs> they, um, that's a good question. They do, they do differ by project. A lot of it has to do with the selection of the alternative delivery method that we use. Um, a lot of our projects that we um, decide to go with a low bid alternative on are projects that we, we typically see most of our savings on as far as construction is concerned. And the reason for that is, is we typically try and build up a contingency because there's a lot of risk also with, with going with a, a low bid contractor. Um, so, but there's also a lot of benefit if the project goes smoothly. And most of our low bid projects are, we look at as more of our straightforward projects where we're not gonna run into a lot of issues. Our, our intersection projects, we typically try not to select or go forward with a low bid alternative because you have a lot of undergrounding issues and you have a lot of right away acquisition issues that can delay the time frame of the project and then the contractors provide uh, you know issuing delay claims and issuing change orders to us and so in the past that's been our the issues that we've had and those are the projects that can run over budget but um, those are the projects that will will typically hire a construction manager at risk and place more of the risk on the contractor to um, deal with those underground utilities and the relocations of those utilities. So that may not answer the, your entire question, uh, but, uh, but that's one of the, the main reasons that uh, we, we see a lot of um, um, savings on some of our capital projects. Yeah, and I guess to, to, to add to that, Councilmember Patent, it's, it's, there's a vigilance in the management of the projects. I mean, what, what and, Andy has a lot of experience with that as to his other uh, engineers in the department. Um, and that experience comes to play in what he just described in terms of 
choosing the, the right delivery method for the right type of project and understanding how um, choosing the wrong delivery method can run your costs up and create delays and, and negative impacts to uh, the public, whether they're residents near a project or people in the case of a roadway project, for example, that are going through an intersection and seeing that project last longer. Um, and it's the experience that they have in knowing how to make um, the right choices at the right time and managing the project and managing the contractors, because also selecting the contractors is, is huge. Um, and managing their work uh, to make sure that uh, they don't go off and do a job in another city and leave our jobs um, undone, because sometimes that delay can also run into money. So, um, but I would also add, uh, because it's, it's a good question, it's an important one, when you see all the things that we do, a lot of it is leveraging partnerships too. So if you think of the things that Andy just described, um, one, we talked about the undergrounding a minute ago, um, leveraging that um, over $400,000 of SRP available money with less than $100,000 of city money. And we got a $500,000 project that benefits the city of Peoria. Um, similarly with um, the, the projects um, um, more, more lately in the northern part of the city where we're working with the county um, to um, improve and speed up, um, say, the Happy Valley Road project that Councilman Binsbacher commented on a few minutes ago. That's working through those partnerships um, to allow uh, for our residents to get um, additional benefit from county funds and county projects. Um, and, um, you know, I spoke earlier about the Maricopa Association of Government and leveraging the money from the state and federal level. Um, so those are ways that we can uh, change um, the, the, the schedule of a project and also sometimes the funding of it. Um, and, and just one more I'll mention uh, is when you look, for example, at the Thunderbird Road uh, improvements from the 101 um, to uh, 83rd, uh, where it was a $4 million estimate two years from now, it's now a $2 million estimate you know, next year, um, and it's gonna accomplish the same thing. And in a case like that, it's the experience of going out and understanding the traffic regime within that corridor and being able to apply their experience to moving the cars without having to do an expensive and disruptive uh, project two years from now. We can get the same benefit doing it now. So sorry it's a long answer, but it was, I thought, a great question. So, yeah. Thank you. Council Member Finn. I had uh, a question and a few follow-ups on the budget wrap-up. I'm just going to throw capital and budget all kind of together for, in the interest of brevity. Um, question for you on the capital. How does the, the Sunrise Mountain purchase impact any of this that's done and presented? Is there any impact, anything that we saw? Is anything for, projected to change? Um, that's wrapped into our capital programming. So, okay. it, I mean, the, the whole, th this is an, a, a year-long process, our capital programming as well as our operating budget. Uh, maybe a sh little bit of shorter time frame on the operating budget, but we start estimating for next year's capital budget this mm. month. I so, know, it never ends. So it never ends. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's shifting. It's, it's like Carl said, we're adjusting. We're looking at value engineering opportunities on some of our projects. In this case, with Sunrise Mountain, we, we know that we've already been approved to, to go forward with the expenditure for the mountain. Yep. So, and that took some of our RTP dollars that we got reimbursed on the Prop 400 initiative. So what we've done is we've adjusted our capital projects based on that. Um, so it, it will not impact our proposed capital budget okay, good. To, is the short answer. Perfect. Okay. Um, and the next thing I wanted to just kind of request just on the budget thing, um, I know I said we beat that horse into glue last night, but it's still twitching just a tiny little bit. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd like for us to maybe look at an adjustment to to kind of take care of those weeds a little bit more. Um, just in thinking about it uh, over the past 24 hours, it just, it seems like, um, seems like it would be prudent to maybe do something there. And other council members might not agree. That's just my suggestion out there that maybe we wanna make a little bit of, of a, more of an effort um, there for that. So um, that would be my suggestion on that. And then um, my final comments, um, as always, you guys do an absolutely ridiculously amazing job at this. And you have all of the answers and everyone out here sitting here is ready to come down and answer any random question that we can possibly come up with and throw on the wall. And you guys always handle them perfectly. So what you guys do, I know it is a ton of work, 
but you guys handle it absolutely amazingly, and I appreciate it more than you will know. So thank you all so much, including everyone out here who sat through two hours of this and came down at the, you know, beck and call. So thank you. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor. So, Mike, should we randomly pick someone to come up? Since they're all anxiously ready to come down? I see, I see a couple of faces are like, no, no. Right. <laughs> Look at all the eye contact. <laughs> no, but I, I want to echo your sentiment. Uh, uh, Carl, you're, you and your staff have done a phenomenal job, as always. Um, you. you have always come prepared with all of the answers and all of our concerns. I, I've met with you and some of your staff uh, multiple times prior to the, this meeting. And uh, you guys have always satisfied my, my answers or my questions. So I want to thank you and all of you for doing everything you do for us and for the city every single day. So thank you so much. I just have two questions, Andy. Mm -hmm. um, on the CIP for um, 19, it's a CIP 119 for the Bell Road 83rd oh. Avenue. It's in fiscal 19 and in 20. Yes. Um, with all the improvements that we've done in the P83 area and the improvements that we're getting ready to, to do with the, um, the plaza company, wouldn't it be prudent to maybe look at moving this project up a little bit? Because do we really want to be having more road construction if we're in the process of building new destination, continuing our destination place, and then all of a sudden having traffic in a brand new um, office building coming, in, coming into play? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. The only issue that we have is we don't have a lot of control. That, that's a Glendale controlled intersection and um, they're not too keen on us installing that. So we're going to have to further our conversations. We can probably move that funding up, but I can't promise that that's going to be asking, installed I'm in just the funding years. To but, see if you can. Yeah. Anything you can do to help speed that along because you know, we're doing a lot of work here to, you know, to bring in new businesses and I'd hate to have new businesses come in only sure. to have traffic delays. Um, yep coming in and out of the area. So anything you can do there, I'd appreciate it. Sure, we'll look with the budget department on moving it up and then further in those conversations with the okay. city of Glendale. And then the last one I promise is uh, CIP 148, which is the Sunrise Mountain Traffic Solution. And this had to do with the Lone Cactus and 83rd, but it yes. also, um, more specifically, the 83rd Avenue, where we were talking about the D-cell, XL lanes. Yes. Is that part of this project? Yes. It is. Yes. Okay. So the goal, I mean, it's a difficult goal, but uh, we're, we're in the process of uh, going, starting the design of that project. We've uh, got a JOC on board uh, to do utility relocation and uh, hopefully start construction as soon as we can after school is out so that we can be done before the start of the new school well, that year. Was my, that was going to be my comment is, is anything you can do to get this done during, you know, the summer break so that we don't repeat last year where the project got delayed a little bit because of the weather and so it was it was right in the midst of brand new school session and the traffic was just kind of a nightmare but the work that you've done out there the last two weeks during spring break to do the curbing and stuff was flawless i mean you guys just nailed that one on the head as far as there was no interruption since school wasn't there traffic mitigation was just minimal so thank you again for having the foresight to do it during spring break you're welcome thank you so that's all i have thank you Councilmember Katena. One last question, Mayor. Thank you. Um, Andy, many years ago, uh, I used to work with Dan Nissen um, with CDBG money. We would do curb cuts. And um, I'm just wondering, does the city still have a curb cut program, or are all the curbs been cut in, uh, in Peoria to allow for people with disabilities to be able to move around effectively? Well, we still have an ADA accessibility program to, to manage those issues. So we look at them. We've actually got a program. We do studies on corridors, um, and, and then we look at the improvements. Our consultant uh, gives us recommendations for improvements, and part of those will be curb cuts or other ADA uh, improvements that we need to make to address across our, our, our city. Um, so that's part of that program. Anyone else? All right. Well, I... Um, <laughs> I think that brings us to the end of our budget. We have uh, just one slide on the, um, the, the follow-ups. Okay. Um, these are the things that uh, you brought up last night, and we don't need to talk about them, um, but I wanted you to know that we captured them. Um, so this is just to let you know we, we always take good notes when the conversations are, are going on, and we've done that again tonight. But these are the items we took down from last night. Um, I think there's another. 
There's one more there. And a couple more. Um, so what we'll do is we'll add the items that you mentioned tonight, and we'll resend um, this list out to you. Um, so you'll have it, and uh, we'll make sure that we've responded to all the things you brought up. Right, and, well, and that's it for our slides. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, this was really an efficient way for us to be able to, to go through all of the things that matter to the citizens of, you know, that we are representing. Uh, it's so important that we maintain the neighborhoods and the feel of our city. Uh, and I can see that you're doing that in our budget. And, you know, really, that's all that we can ask for, that our citizens get everything that they need in their community to feel like it is their home, their hometown, their hometown, I mean. So um, safe, secure, beautiful, that's the city of Peoria. Thank you for showing up in our budget. We really appreciate everything that you have all done. And, and thank you for all of your comments, um, your questions, um, your suggestions, and uh, for recognizing the good work of the staff. We really appreciate that. Thank you. We are adjourned.